Hey, my name is Felipe and welcome to this 3 hours course on OpenCV with Python. This is going to be an amazing course, we are going to start talking about what exactly are images in OpenCV, then I'm going to show you how to read an image or a video from your computer, then I'm going to talk about some basic operations like grouping and resizing, and then I'm going to walk you through the most important functions and filters like color spaces, blurring, threshold, edge detection, drawing, contours, and I have also prepared a bonus lesson, a surprise lesson which is something super and absolutely unique and original and you're not going to see it anywhere else on YouTube. And I have also prepared two projects in which we are going to apply absolutely everything we learned in this course. The first project is about color detection and the other project is about building a face anonymizer. So this is going to be an amazing course, this course is ideal for beginners in OpenCV and computer vision and now let's get started. So the first thing we need to discuss in this course is what are images. Because if we're going to be working with OpenCV, then we're going to be working with images all the time and we definitely need to know what are images in order to work with images, right? So let's talk about images. The first thing we need to say about images in OpenCV is that images are NumPy arrays. If you're familiar with Python, then it's very likely you will be familiar with NumPy. NumPy is a very very popular Python package in order to do different type of mathematical operations and numerical calculations. So NumPy is a very popular Python package and this is the first thing we need to say about what are images in OpenCV. Images are NumPy arrays. And you can see this is an example, this is only a few lines of code, a couple of lines of code. And what I'm doing in this example is reading an image and then then I'm printing this type, right? I am printing the image type and you can see that the output is that this image is an NumPy array. So this is an example you can do yourself also and you are going to see exactly the same output. So now let's continue and now that we know that the images are NumPy arrays, let's see what happens when we ask for the image shape, right? As images are NumPy arrays, we can definitely print what's the image shape, right? This is something we can do with absolutely any NumPy array. And this is the uh, output we get, for example, in this particular example in this particular image I am loading over here in this example and this is the how we can make sense of this information right when we get something like this the first element will be the height the second element will be the width and the third element will be the number of channels of that specific image right so we have height width and number of channels right those are the dimensions of our image now let's see it with a very very specific example. For example in this case this is the image of a squirrel <laughs> and let's assume this is the image I am loading over here and I got this uh, output for its shape 720, 1280 and 3 channels. And this is exactly what this means, right? So we have a height of 720, a width of 1280, and then three channels, right? And in this case, we have an image which is in BGR. So the three channels are going to be the blue component, the green component, and the red components, right? So this is just like a very, very specific example of how you can make sense of this height, width, and number of channels information of a... a random image or an image you load using inbreed. So let's continue. Now let's talk about the composition of how an image is composed and we are going to say an image is made by pixels, right? And this is an example with another image, in this case we have an image which is much 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 smaller and we have that the height for this image is 7, the width is 15 and you can see that this image is comprised of many many different blocks, right? Uh, this is something we can definitely see because in this case we have a much 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 smaller image and you can see that for example we have 7 blocks in this co coordinate and we have 15 blocks in this other coordinate, right? And each one of these blocks in the entire image is a pixel. This is how we are going to call to the basic component of an image, right? A pixel. This is where the information will be stored in an image, right? Absolutely every single image will be comprised, will be composed of many different pixels and this is exactly the how the, the pixels look like, right? For example, in this very specific example, each one of these blocks is a pixel, right? That's how they are called. 
And now let's talk about the range for these pixels, right? These pixels are going to have many different values. Let's talk about what are the values, the possible values for the pixels. And we're going to say that in most cases, this uh, value, the pixel value, will range from 0 to 255 right it will be an integer value will which will range from 0 to 255 that's very important and that's going to happen in most cases and we're not really defining what exactly is most cases but let's just keep in mind that this is what's going to happen in most cases in many cases now there will be some situations in which we will have another value another range or another different type of values for the pixels and a very specific example is what happens with binary images in binary images absolutely every single pixel will be either black or white and its value will be either 0 for black pixels or 1 for white pixels and in some situations you can also see it like this which is either 0 or 255 right so in binary images we will not have a range from 0 to 255 but we will have absolutely uh, for absolutely every single pixel one of these two values either 0 or 1 or in some more cases either 0 or 255 and then another example is images which are made of 16 bit pixels, right? Where absolutely every single pixel is uh, saved, the information in that pixel is saved with 16 bits, or also known as 2 bytes, right? I will say in most cases, in most images you are going to be working with, the uh, images will be 8 bits, right? Absolutely every single pixel will be only 1 byte. But in some cases there are also images of uh, 16 bits and in this case the values, the possible values for absolutely every single pixel go from 0 to 65,535. That's very important and that's another thing we need to know about the images. Now let's see a few examples about this range for the different pixels and this is the same image I showed you a few minutes ago about this squirrel and you can see that now I'm considering only this very small square we have over here, this very small white square and in this square this is the information, the pixel information for all the three channels, right? Remember this image is comprised of three different channels, blue, green and red and if I look at those three channels in this very specific square which let's assume it's something three by three right it's three columns and three rows these are the values for all the different pixels in this square uh, you can see that we have many different values in different uh, many different values which are ranging from uh, i think the the smaller one of all of these numbers is 15 and the larger one is something like 117 right so we are here in this case absolutely every single pixel will range from 0 to 255 so this is an example of this case of what happens in most cases this is what, what's going to happen with all bgr images uh, and then this is another example and in this case we are going to be working with a binary image so we are here right binary image pixel value is in 0 1 or 0 255 so in this case this image will be encoded absolutely every single pixel will be either 1 or a 0 right you can see that absolutely all white pixels are 1 and absolutely all black pixels are 0 right so this is, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to discuss regarding what are images in OpenCV. So remember, an image is a non-PRI. Right? We can ask for the image shape and the first element will be the height, the second one the width and the third one the number of channels. Then absolutely every single image is made by pixels and the value for this pixel is going to range from 0 to 255 in most cases but there will be other situations in which we will have a different range for example for a binary image absolutely every single pixel will be either 0 or 1 or either 0 or 255 so that's going to be all for this lesson and now let's move to the next lesson so let's see how we can input and output data using OpenCV and let's start with images so let's see how we can read an image from our computer from our hard drive how we can write an image back to our computer back to our file system and how we can visualize an image and in order to do that I am going to define a new variable which is called image path 
and in order to define image path I'm going to import OS which is another library and this is how I am going to do the image I'm going to use in order to show you how to work with images in OpenCV it's located in the current directory within another directory which is called data so this is how I'm going to define image path I'm going to define it like os.path.join the current directory data and the image is called bird.jpg okay now I am going to define a new, another variable which is called img and img is equal to cv2.imread which is the function we are going to use in order to read images using OpenCV remember this function, this is the most important function in this chapter cv2.imread and then I'm going to specify the image path and that's all we need in order to read an image from our computer, from our hard drive now let's see how we can do exactly the opposite process now let's uh, assume, let's suppose we have an image in our memory, in our uh, program, in our script and we want to write this image into our computer this is how we're going to do, we're going to call another cv2 function which is called imwrite you can see this function, it uh, follows exactly the same structure as this one this is imread and this is imwrite so it's exactly the same uh, structure as in the previous case and we need to input the location in which we want to save this image so let's say this will be exactly the same location but this will be birdout.jpg, right? and let's uh, just save exactly the same image back to our computer this is what we are going to do, right? and it's exactly the same image but we are changing the name we are saving this image with another name which is birdout.jpg, right? so I'm just going to execute this script and I'm going to show you how this looks like you can see that these are the three files I have in this directory, in this data directory BIRD is the image I have read from my file system, from my computer and then this is BIRD OUT this is the image I have saved into my computer this is the image I have saved using imwrite, right? so I am using imread to read this image and then I am using imwrite to write this image, right? it's exactly the same image, we are not doing absolutely anything with it so we are just taking it from our computer and we are saving it under a different name that's exactly uh, what we are doing and that's absolutely all we are doing for now so we have completed these two steps which are reading an image from our computer and then writing an image back to our computer now let's see how we can do in order to visualize images, right? we are just going to take this image we have read and we are going to visualize it using OpenCV and for this we are going to call cv2 imshow which is the other function we are going to see now and we need to define two arguments one of them will be the name of the window in which we are going to visualize the image and we're just going to call this window frame or let's just call this image this window image because we are going to visualize an image and then I am just going to input img which is the image we are reading from our file system and then another thing we need to specify is this other function which is wait key and long story short, the only thing we're doing with this function is telling OpenCV to wait, to wait until I press a key so OpenCV is just going to open a window with my frame, with my image on it and then it's just going to wait with this window on it and definitely it's going to wait forever until I press a key that's basically what I'm doing with this sentence and for now just remember that this sentence is very important when you are visualizing an image it's very important and I'm going to show you what happens if you forget to uh, write it, right? but for now let's just execute this function as it is so you can see that now we are visualizing exactly the same image I show you in my local file system, right? this is the image we are reading and this is the image we are visualizing exactly, exactly the same image and I told you that this wait key function is very very important so now I'm going to show you what happens if I forget to do it, right? now I'm just going to call imshow and I'm not going to call wait key immediately after and this is what happens 
You can see I'm running the code. Everything has been executed successfully and there's no visualization whatsoever. So what's going on right now is we are visualizing the image, but OpenCV just opens the window and just immediately closes it, right? That's why we are not seeing it. So long story short, long story short just remember to specify this function and this number we are writing here, it's the number of milliseconds you want OpenCV to keep this window open. Take a look what happens if I specify 5000. 5000 means 5000 milliseconds, which means 5 seconds. So this is what happens. I'm just going to press play. We are seeing the image. We are visualizing the image. And now after five seconds, everything is completed and I didn't press any key, right? So uh, always remember to specify wait key. And if you do it with the number zero means the OpenCV is just going to wait with the window open indefinitely forever, right? So these are the three steps we just cover how to read an image from our computer, how to write an image back to our computer and how to visualize an image using ImShow. And now let's see how we can do exactly the same process but with a video. Videos are other very important type of data we usually work with in computer vision and with OpenCV so we definitely need to know how to do exactly the same process with a video. But this is going to be a somehow simplified process because the only thing we're going to do is reading the video from our computer and then we're just going to visualize the video. We're not going to write the video back to our computer for, for now because that's a slightly more complex process and for now let's just focus on these two items. So the process will be very similar. I'm just going to import OS. And I am going to specify a video path, which is something like this. It's the video is located in exactly the same location as the image we just used. And this is something like data and then uh, monkey dot mp4. And then we need to call cv2 dot video capture that's the function we are going to use and we need to specify the video path and let's call it video right so this is exactly how we are going to read a video from our file system from our computer right so this is exactly how we need to do now let's move on to the next step which is visualizing this video and in order to visualize it i am going to define a variable which is red and I am going to initialize red as true. And you're going to see why in just a minute. Now I'm going to define a while and I'm going to say while red. And this is how we are going to do. Uh, I'm going to read frames from this video by calling video.read. And video.read will return two variables. One of them will be red and the other one, let's call it frame. Right, And the way we are going to make sense of these two variables is that frame will be the actual frame we are reading from this video and red is a variable which is, uh, it's a boolean variable which means if the frame was read successfully or not. Because remember we are reading a video and as long as we have frames left everything will be okay and red will be true but once we have reached the end of the video we will not have any frames left and red will be false. That's how we are going to make sense of the information in red. It's a boolean value which is true every time we have successfully read a new frame and it will be false if we have not read a new frame successfully. So now let's continue. What I'm going to do now is calling cv2 in show exactly the same as before. Now let's call this window frame because we are going to visualize a frame. And this is the frame we are going to visualize, right? Now let's call cv2 wait key. But now instead of waiting uh, indefinitely, instead of waiting and putting a number zero as we did here, let's do something different. The video I am going to read, it's uh, 25 frames per second. So 25 fr frames per second means that we have one frame every 40 milliseconds, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell OpenCV to wait 40 milliseconds 
uh, after it visualizes every single frame, right? I'm going to tell OpenCV to keep this window open for exactly 40 milliseconds. And by doing so, we are going to have the impression that we are going to see this video executed in real time because OpenCV is going to display one frame after the other. The only thing it's going to do is display a frame, it's going to wait 40 milliseconds, it's going to display the next frame and so on. But we will have the impression we are seeing a video running on real time right so uh, this is value we are going to specify for the weight key parameter and another thing we're going to do remember that red is a boolean value which specifies if we were successfully uh, if we are reading a new frame successfully or not so this is how i am going to do i'm going to say if red then visualize the frame and if not then don't do it that's very important because once we have reached the end of the video we will not have any frame left to read and uh, red will be false and then we will have an error if we don't do this we will have an error so this is very important now let's see what happens i'm going to execute this uh, code and you can see we are running exactly this code and we are visualizing the video i have specified and we are looking at a monkey which is peeling some sort of fruit and it's using absolutely all of its body in order to peel this fruit. This is exactly the video we are uh, visualizing and you see what happened, right? We are visualizing one frame after the other, one frame after the other. And after we have visualized absolutely all the frames, the program just terminates and everything is just completed. So this is exactly how you can visualize a video using OpenCV. And something else we should do after everything is completed is calling video.release and then cv2 destroy all windows. This is very important because this is the way OpenCV is going to release the memory it has, it has allocated for this video, for this object. So always remember to call these two uh, sentences, these two lines after calling a video after doing something like this. Let's see if we can run exactly the same without any error and everything has been executed just fine. So these two lines are very important and please remember to add these two lines at the end of every script where you are doing a similar process, where you are loading a video, where you are reading a video. So this is exactly how you can work with the input and output of a video. And now let's move to a webcam. Let's see how we can do exactly the same process, but with our webcam. In this case, we don't really need to specify OS and we don't really need to specify an image location or a, a file location because we're going to be working with our webcam. And this is how we're going to do. I'm going to call CB2 video capture. And I'm going to specify the number of the webcam I want to access, right? In my case, we, I am not going to access the number zero, but I'm going to access the number two. I have more than one webcam attached to my computer and now I'm going to access the number two. Remember, this is the number, the ID of the webcam you want to access. If you only have one webcam in your computer, most likely this will be the number zero. But remember, you could also specify all values if you have all webcams attached to your computer. So in my case, I'm just going to call the number two and this will be webcam. And now, now in order to visualize this webcam, uh, what I'm going to do, this will be a very, very similar process as in the previous case. So I'm going to call a while loop, but in this case, we are going to call a while true because when we are reading frames from our webcam, we never reach the end, right? We always have new frames to read. So I'm just going to call while true. And this will be something like this, uh, red, frame equal to webcam dot read we are assuming red will always be true that's our assumption because there's not any reason to assume otherwise we are just reading frames from our webcam so red always should be true and now we are going to do exactly the same as before cb2 im show i'm going to call this window frame just as before and i'm going to call I'm going to input frame. Then I'm going to say cv2 wait key. And I'm going to specify 40 as well. 
For now, I'm just going to specify 40. And at the end of this uh, chapter, at the end of this lesson, I'm going to share a few comments regarding this value in the case of a webcam. But for now, let's just say this is 40. And I'm going to release the memory of my webcam too. So this will be something like webcam.release and cv2 um, uh, destroy all windows. Also, also, we need to specify this uh, value, which is the, the, the amount of time we have to wait. But as we are taking frames from more webcam continuously and we are in a while through, ideally we should have a way to go out of this while through, right? And this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to define it like this and 0xff equal to orth q if this happens then we are going to break the loop right basically what this means is that we are going to wait 40 milliseconds after we are visualizing absolutely every single frame and once the user presses the letter q we are going to go out of this while true that's exactly what we are saying here right we are going to break this while true when the user presses the letter Q. That's the, what we are saying. It's it's a little weird the way this is expressed, but this is just the way it works in OpenCV. So let's execute this script and let's see what happens. You can see that now we are taking frames from my webcam and everything is okay. Everything is perfect. And now let, let's see what happens. I'm just going to press random keys from my keyboard. I'm going to press the letter P. Nothing happens. I'm going to press the letter L. Nothing happens. The letter I. Nothing happens. And now this is what happens if I press the letter Q. I am moving away. I'm moving out of this while true, right? I'm breaking the while true. I'm just terminating the execution of this program. So uh, this is exactly how you can work with a webcam, how you can read a webcam and how you can visualize all the frames from a webcam. Now, these are my comments regarding this number. So we have input this number, which is 40. But the thing is that when you are reading frames from your webcam, the process is slightly, slightly slower than when you are reading frames from a video you have in your local computer. The process is slightly, slightly uh, slower. So the amount of time you have to wait, the way you compute, the way you calculate how much time you have to wait, it's slightly more complex. So we are not really going to cover the how to set this number in this chapter, in this lesson. For now, just remember that the amount of time you should wait between different frames, it's, uh, it depends on the amount of time it takes to the webcam to read a frame and also to the amount of frames per second you are getting from this webcam. So the process is slightly more complex as in the previous case. So this is going to be all for now. So let's talk about some basic operations in OpenCV. Let's talk about image resizing and image cropping. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to resize an image and how to crop an image. So let's get started. Let's start with resizing. I am going to import OS and also OpenCV, obviously. <laughs> and now I'm going to define an image which is called IMG. And this will be CV2 in read. And then the location of my image, which is located in my current directory and is called docs.jpg. Now let's see this image size. I am going to print image.shape and I'm also going to visualize this image so we know how it looks like. We we need to do something like image, image, right? I am creating a new window and I am calling this window image. Now I'm going to call cv2 wait key and I'm going to tell OpenCV to keep this window open forever or until I press a key. <laughs> and let's see what happens. You can see that this is the image I am reading from my hard drive. This is the image of two dogs. And if we look at the print, I can see here in my terminal, 
This image size is 960 times 1280. So this is the image size and this means it's 960 pixels height and 1280 pixels width. This is the current size of our image and this is how the image looks like. Now let's try to resize this image into a different size. I am going to call cb 2 dot resize that's the function we are going to use in order to resize an image i'm going to input my image and now i'm going to input the new size for this image the size i want this image to be resized to right so i am going to resize this image in half i am going to resize the width in half and also the height in half i have to input two numbers the first number will be the new width which i'm going to say this will be 640 and then the second number will be the new height which i will say this is 480 this is half <laughs> 480 is half 960 i could have used a calculator but i think i didn't need to do it <laughs> so this will be the new size this is the new size of our image and i will call this new image uh, resize image now let's print the size of the new image and also let's plot it okay now i'm going to press play and let's see what happens and this is what we get you can see that this is the original image and this is the resized image and you can see that the height of the original image is twice the height of the resized image right and if i look at the width i see the same proportion the width of the resized image is half the width of the original image so everything seems to be working properly and now let's see at the prints this is the print of the original image remember 960 times 1280 and this is the print for the resize image you can see that the uh, resize image height it's exactly a height i have specified over here and the resize image width is exactly the width i have specified over here please mind that in here in the resizing we are specifying width and then height but when we are printing the image shape, we are getting height and then width. Please mind this detail because otherwise it could be a little confusing. So this is exactly how you can resize an image using OpenCV and this is going to be all for the image resizing. Obviously you can choose whatever size you want and also you can make the image larger if you want. You can play, you can play around with different sizes, you can do absolutely anything you want. Also. You don't necessarily have to keep proportions. For example, if I do something like this, 640, 640, if I make the image into a square, you can see that this is the resize image. It doesn't follow the proportions of the original image, but OpenCV just complied with my commands, right? OpenCV just gave me the, the resizing I specify, although the image is obviously not keeping the proportions uh, of the original image. This is only to show you that you can specify whatever number you want here. So this will be all for the resizing and now let's move to the cropping. And let's start by importing OS and also CV2 the same way as we did before. And now let's start to by defining IMG the same way we did for the resizing. Let's do something like this CV2 imread ospat join current directory and then docs.jpg. And I have to say this is equal to this. Okay. And now let's work with cropping. Let's visualize the image again so I can show you something. Uh, 
This is the image I showed you before. And in order to show you how to crop an image, I am going to show you how to crop this image so we only keep the dogs, right? You can see that these are two dogs which are somehow centered into a huge image, right? So I am going to show you how to crop this image so we only get the dogs. So let's stop this now. And the way we are going to do it, let's remember what's the size of this image. Uh, I am going to print image shape. We get 960 times 1280. And the way we are going to define this crop will be something like this. I am going to define a new variable, which is cropped image. And we are not going to use an OpenCV function. The way we are going to crop an image is by selecting the intervals we want for the crop. So uh, remember that an image in OpenCV is an ampy array. So the way we are going to do it is by just specifying the uh, intervals we need. And if we go back to the plotting, we can see that the dogs we are going to crop are pretty much in the center. So they are pretty much in the, let's say, in the third part of the height and in the third part of the width, right? It's something like third and third. So I am going to do something like this and let's see if it works. I am going to define my cropped image like uh, this is height first. So this will be something like 300, 320 and 640, right? I'm just going to keep the middle third of this image and then for the width, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to specify it from 420 to 840, something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect. And now I'm going to visualize it. Let's see if it works. It didn't work, so let's try a little better. Uh, let's say this will be something like, let's say 220 and 6, 740 and 320 and 940. Let's see now. And now it's a little better. So you can see that now we are cropping the image. Now we are getting a new image. We are plotting a new image. And this image is a crop of the original image. If I do something like this, you can see that they pretty much uh, match, right? You can see that we are getting a match. And the way I did it, if you, uh, if we go back to the code, is by specifying exactly the interval I'm interested in in the original image. You can see that I have specified 220, 740 for the height. And if I go back to the original image, you can see that 220, 740 for the height. We are, right, please follow these numbers which are over here. 220, it's around here for the height, and then 740, it's around here, right? Around here. And then for the width, we have specified 320, 940. So 320, we are here, and 940, we are around here, right? So this is exactly the crop we are getting. We are, cropping, we are cropping exactly those intervals we have specified. And this is exactly how you can crop an image using OpenCV. So these are basic operations, but these are very important operations. In pretty much any computer vision project you work in, most likely you will need to do something related to image resizing, image cropping, or both. Because these are basic operations, but these are very important. <laughs> so. This is going to be all for this lesson and this is exactly how you can resize and crop an image using OpenCV. So, color spaces. This lesson is about how to work with color spaces in OpenCV. And this is one of my favorite topics, actually. I really, really like uh, color spaces. I really like all the theory behind color spaces. And we could spend hours talking about color spaces. But obviously, in this lesson, it's just like a very introductory uh, course, a very introductory lesson about how to work with color spaces. But please remember, we could go as crazy as we want and as deep as we want 
want because there's a lot to talk about when we talk about color spaces. But let's take it one step at a time. Let's start this lesson by just taking an image, reading an image from disk and visualizing this image, right? Uh, so I'm going to import OS, I'm going to import CV2 and I am going to define an image which is called IMG and this is CV2 in read and OSPAT join and the image is called bird.jpg and then I'm just going to visualize it by defining two arguments img which is the name of the window in which we are going to visualize this image and then the image I'm going to visualize and this is weight key and the number zero right and if I press play something is not right bird.jpg <laughs> I forgot the extension now everything should be okay so this is the image I have chosen for today's lesson and you can see that this is a bird, a green bird and there are a few extra colors on this image too. So in order to get started with color spaces and in order to get started getting some intuition behind color spaces, every time you read an image in uh, OpenCV using imread, this image will be in the VGR color space, which means that absolutely every single pixel in this image is a combination of the blue, green and red colors, right? Absolutely every single pixel is just like a combination of these three colors. For example, if I put my mouse here and please take a look at these uh, values over here. If I put my mouse there, you can see that it says R140, G201 and B61, which means the value for the red color is 140, for the green color is 201, and for the blue color is 61. So this is what it means that absolutely every single pixel is a combination of these three values. And this is how the BGR color space works, right? In the BGR color space, that's the name of this color space, BGR, absolutely every single pixel in the image, it's a combination of these three colors. And remember, every time you read an image using OpenCV, this image will be in the VGR color space. Now, let me show you a function, which is the function we are going to use in order to convert from all the different color space, from a color space for, to another color space, which is called convert color, right? This is the OpenCV function we are going to use in order to convert an image, which is in a given color space, to another color space, right? So we have many different color spaces and we can convert the image from one to another, right? We are still getting some intuition behind how color spaces work. So just uh, let's take it one step at a time. Now let's convert this image from the VGR color space to the RGB color space. And this is how we're going to do it, right? And let's call this new image, image RGB. Now I'm going to plot this image and also image RGB, right? So I'm taking my image in VGR, in the VGR color space, and I'm converting this image into the RGB color space, which is a different color space. If I press play, you can see that I'm still getting the same image as before. And now I'm getting this new image, which is image RGB, which it's exactly the same image in a way, but the colors look a, dif a little different, right? And this is because we have converted the image, we have converted the color space from BGR to RGB. So as I mentioned before, we could definitely go crazy with color spaces and we could talk for hours uh, about color spaces, but you can think about all the different color spaces as different ways to represent an image or different ways to express the colors in an image, right? Or different ways to express the information in an image. In this case, this was the original image in BGR. This is the image in RGB. And you can see that the, the way these two color spaces work, BGR means blue, green, and red. RGB means red, green, and blue. So basically what we are doing here is switching the colors. We are switching the blue and the red color. Everything that used to be blue now is red and the other way around, right? We are switching the uh, position of these two colors, right? That's what we are doing. So if we visualize the image into using ImShow, uh, as we have converted from BGR to RGB, you can see that everything that used to be red, like this peak 
this uh, feather over here and this tree or this uh, stick or this uh, tree leaves or something like that now everything looks like bluish right this is because we have switched the position of the blue and the red colors but it's very important to notice that we are still looking at the same image in a way right we are still looking at the same information the only thing we are doing is just changing how this information is organized right but the, 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 that's the only thing we're doing then it's exactly exactly the same image that's i think it's the most important intuition behind color spaces and that's what i want you to take from this lesson all the different color spaces which are many 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 it, they are only different ways to express the information they are different ways to organize the information right another very popular use case of converting between color spaces is converting to grayscale so i'm going to copy and paste this line and i'm going to say from bgr to gray and i'm going to call this gray now i'm going to convert my image my bgr image into grayscale and this is how it looks like sorry copy paste and this should be all okay now i'm going to visualize all of them the bgr the rgb and also the grayscale and this is the uh, rgb we don't really need the the rgb anymore so we are going to uh, i'm going to show you the, the grayscale the the idea the intuition behind this color conversion from bgr to grayscale is having the information from three channels into only one channel right before our information was among the blue green and red channel which are three channels so we have a lot of information for, because for absolutely every single pixel we have a value for blue for red and for green that's a lot of information and we are somehow condensing all this information into only one channel right we are creating an image which is a grayscale image so we only have one channel and we have different variations of the same uh, color right we only have one color and we have different variations uh, that's how a grayscale image looks like you can see that now if we look at here we have only uh, a value which says l111 and if we go here it says 133 and then 159 and so on right we only have one value we only have one channel now let me show you another color space which is very very popular remember there are many 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 color spaces so we can definitely spend hours looking at all of them it's not the idea for today's lesson i'm just going to show you a few of them and i'm going to show you the hsv color space which is another color space which is very 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 popular in computer vision and it has some very very popular use cases and I'm going to show you how it looks like. So now I'm going to plot, I'm just going to plot the original image and the HSB. So I'm going to do something like this. So you can see that this is the original image and this is the HSB image, which looks like super, super crazy, right? This doesn't really look like a bird. This doesn't really look real. This doesn't really look like anything we have seen before and it, it's exactly the case right this is the hsb representation of this image this is the image the original image converted into the hsb color space and this image in hsb in the hsb color space has some very 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 important applications some very very important use cases for example if we will be trying to detect color we will definitely use the hsb color space but if we look at the hsb color space we are going to see something that it appears it doesn't make any sense whatsoever <laughs> this is only to show you that all the different color spaces some of them or actually all of them they are very useful for their use case for their purpose but some of them may not have any uh, sense whatsoever when we are looking at an image in that color space for example in this case looking at an image in the hsv color space may be completely meaningless for for us for a human right when we are looking at an image we are looking at this image with our eyes with our human vision and our human vision is trained to look at a bgr rgb right to look at images as a combination of the green red and blue colors so if we look at something in hsb it looks very crazy but remember this is another color space which is very very popular and very popular in computer vision you're going to find many many projects many applications of 
um, the HSV color space and one of the most popular applications is color detection and that's pretty much the one of the most popular color spaces in computer vision and if I show you a list if I show you this list you can see that these are all the possible values we have for this constant right the, here we used color bgr to gray here, here we use color bgr to rgb color bgr to hsv in order to do different color conversions and these are all the values for that parameter for that argument for that constant these are all the different values we could choose right because remember there are many 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 uh, color spaces and we could perfectly be converting from any color space to any other color space so that value that constant could take different uh, values right you can see that this is a super 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 long list and this is only to give you an idea of all the different possibilities you have when you are converting between color spaces so uh, this is pretty much all for now this is only to give you some ideas some intuition be behind color spaces so this is something like the tip of the iceberg of color spaces obviously we could spend hours talking about all the different color spaces and there's a lot of mathematics behind color spaces so trust me we could go crazy talking about color spaces and, and talking hours and hours probably we could create an entire course many entire courses about color spaces so we could go as deep as we want this was only like the tip of the iceberg and please remember that there are many many different color spaces all of these color spaces are different ways to express the information of an image to express the colors of an image and there are different use cases for which you want to use a color space or another one and also remember this function, which is called CBT color. And this is a function you're going to use in order to convert from one color space to another color space. Remember, we could go as crazy as we want with this topic, but now it's not the time. So this is going to be all for this lesson. And let's move to the next lesson. In this lesson, we are going to work with image blurring. I am going to show you different OpenCV functions you can use in order to apply a blur on top of your images. Image blurring is very, very important. You definitely need to become familiar with this technique. It has many different use cases and maybe one of the most popular and one of the most common use cases for blurring an image is to remove noise. Remember, every time you work with images or with data, you will be dealing with noise. <laughs> and it's very important to become familiar with different techniques in order to remove the noise on these images. So let me show you all the different functions from OpenCV you can use in order to apply a blur. This is from the OpenCV official documentation. And you can see that we have these four functions in order to apply a blur. These four functions are basically the same in terms that you will always be blurring your images, but the, it will be different the way you apply this blur, right? For now, just remember that you have many different options, different functions, which you can apply in order to blur your images. And before starting with the coding, before showing you these functions and how they work, I want to give you like a very, very high level intuition on how blurring works. Every time you are going to be blurring an image, I want you to think about averages, right? Every time you will be applying a blur, you will be averaging your images. You will be computing averages. So you will be replacing absolutely every single pixel by the average of all the other pixels which are around it, right? By the average of all the pixels in a neighborhood around that given pixel, right? That's like the high level intuition of how blurring works, of, uh, of how all these different blurring functions work. And that's like the intuition I want you to keep in mind, right? Every time you apply a blur, you are computing averages and you are replacing every pixel by the average value of all the pixels in a neighborhood around that given pixel, right? And the way you compute that average and the way you define this neighborhood, right? The size of this neighborhood, the way you, you define those two things is going to depend on the specific uh, blurring function you are using and it's going to depend on the parameters you input into that function so that's something that's like a very high level intuition i want you to keep in mind before starting with this tutorial and now let's go to pycharm 
This is a PyCharm project I created for this lesson. You can see that this is only some boilerplate code. The only thing I'm doing here is reading an image and then I am showing, displaying this image. So uh, the image I'm, I'm loading is called freelancer.jpg and let me show you exactly how it looks like. This is the image we are going to be using in this lesson. You can see that this is a freelancer which is having a coffee and it's checking his mail or something like that. It's doing something in the computer. We don't know exactly what. <laughs> and this is the image we are going to be using in order to show you how these different learning functions work. So in order to get started, let's start with the classical blur, which is cb2.blur, right? This is the way you are going to call this function. We need to input the image we want to blur and also we need to input a kernel size or actually we need to input these two parameters. Remember that I told you that this, this high level intuition about how blurring works, you are always taking averages and it all depends on the size of the neighborhood you are taking in order to compute this average. So we are going to input two parameters which are going to define exactly what's the size of this neighborhood. Uh, and I'm going to make this uh, neighborhood a square and I'm going to say k size will be equal to 7, right? So I'm going to say something like this. So this is how I'm defining this neighborhood, this is how I'm defining like the proximity of, the, of absolutely every pixel and this is a parameter you need to input when you are applying a blur, you can apply different values. I am applying exactly the same in both uh, coordinates, but you can just apply different values. And, the, you, and you definitely need to do something like this. And I have chosen k, k equals 7 just because obviously you can apply our values. The larger this number, the stronger the blur, right? Or the bigger the region you will be taking in order to compute this average. So I'm going to show you a few examples with a very low value of k and with a very high value of k so you can see the difference. But just remember the general structure for this function, right? You need to input an image and then the size of the neighborhood you want to take, you want to consider in order to compute these averages. And this function, this is the classical blur, and this will be most likely this will be more than enough in most of your projects, most of the times you want to apply a blurring function. This is the classical blur and this will be more than enough. I'm also going to show you two additional functions, but the this one, which is the classical one, is the one which is most commonly used when applying blurs. Um, and this will be just fine in most of your applications, in most of your projects. So I'm going to call this image blur. And that's pretty much all. So now I'm going to display the original image and also the blur image. And let's see how it looks like. So this is the image we input. This is the original image of our freelancer who is having a coffee. And this is the blur image. You can see that it's exactly the same image, exactly the same information, but now it looks like uh, like blurred, right? Because we are losing detail in this image. If you always keep in mind how blurring works, uh, that it involves taking averages, that's going to help you to understand why the image looks the way it does, right? So I'm going to show you what happens if I put like a larger number, something like 70. Let me show you what happens and you can see that now we are still i mean it's still the same image but now everything is like completely like completely we are losing a lot of information and basically that that's because we are taking like a huge neighborhood in order to compute these averages and now we are just like averaging a lot of information together and that's just yeah we are just losing a lot of information that's basically why this is going on uh, you can see that still the same image. We have something here, so we have something here. Uh, all those regions which are very large regions from the same color, like for example the t-shirt, remain like the same color. The same about this, the same about this part over here. You can see it remains pretty much the same. But all the other regions which are not large enough, for example the person's face, 
which there are many colors and many different objects near to it, then uh, we are just losing the, the, all the information and now it doesn't make any sense at all. So this is only to keep in mind that the size you decide for this uh, neighborhood is going to affect the way the image uh, looks like or the way this blurring looks like. So I'm just going to return to a lower value of 7, which I think is going to be okay, right? We want to lose some detail, but we don't really want to lose that much detail as before. Uh, so something like this will be just fine. And now let's move to other functions, which you can also use in order to apply a blur on your images. From the OpenCV documentation, you can see that there are four functions. But in this lesson, I'm only going to show you three because this one is a little more advanced. And I, I think it's it's a better strategy to focus on these three functions from now for now so this was the classical blur and now let me show you how uh, the gaussian blur looks like i'm going to call cv2 dot gaussian blur um, i need to input the image and then i need to input this value the same value as before and now i'm going to input an additional parameter which i'm going to set in three and this is needed by by the way the gaussian blur works so i am going to call this image gaussian blur and this will be enough if i'm not mistaken and i'm going to press play so you can see that this was the original image this is the classical blur and this is the gaussian blur you can see that pretty much it looks the exactly the same as the other one i mean it could look a little different maybe but it's pretty much the same you can play around with these values you can make this instead of a three we can make it a five uh, this has to do with the way this uh, blurring is computed but you can see that it's pretty much the same uh, and so on. You can also make it a larger region. And maybe there we, I mean, if you, if you, if you look at the images super, super in a super detailed way, you're going to see they look different. I mean, in both cases, we have an image which is being blurred, but the way this blur is, this blurring is, is done. It's, uh, makes the images slightly, slightly different. So anyway, this is how the Gaussian blur looks like for this image. And now let me show you the medium blur, which is going to be the other blur we are going to do today. Medium blur will be cb 2median blur. And this receives the image and only k size. We don't need to input two values, but only one. Uh, because in the case of median, we're always taking a square. So I'm going to press play. I'm also going to visualize it. And you can see that this definitely looks different as the all the other ones. I'm going to, I have too many windows. So let's see if I can put all of them in the same uh, in my screen. Let's see if we can look at all of them at once. I'm going to organize them, something like this, something like this. Okay, so this was the original image. This is the classical blur. This is the Gaussian blur. And now this is the medium blur. And you can tell this one definitely looks different as the other two. Definitely looks a little different. You can still see that it's the same idea. We are taking averages. We are applying a blur. We are losing detail. But the way this uh, blurring is done, the way this function is being applied, you can see that it, the image looks different as in the other case. So this is another blur you can also use in your projects. And uh, depending on your use case, you may want to use one function or the other. So this is pretty much all in order to show you the different functions and how to use all these different functions. And now I'm going to show you a very specific example of how to apply a blur in order to remove the noise of an image, which is one of the most popular applications of applying blurs. So I'm going to use another function, another image, which is cowsaltpepper.png. Uh, and before applying all these blurs, I am going to show you how the image looks like. So 
this is now we are only going to see the image we are not going to see all the blurs and this is the image i am going to show you how to uh, how to work with this is the image uh, i am going to show you in this example you can see that this is the image of a cow this is a grayscale image of a cow and if you look closely you will see it has like a lot of noise in the background right this uh, this is an image i created myself i added noise myself i added noise intentionally to this image because i wanted to make it look the way it does this is like a very very specific type of noise and now let's see if we can remove this noise applying all these uh, blurring functions applying all these filters using opencv all these blurring filters so i am going to and comment these three lines and let's see what happens so now these are the three uh, sorry these are the three images let's this these ones are a little bigger and a little larger so let's display it once at, one at a time this is the original image and this is the classical blur you can see that now uh, we are not really seeing anything too impressive we are still seeing some noise we are still seeing the cow i mean we are not really seeing anything too too impressive Let's move to the other two functions. Let's see how they look like. This is the Gaussian blur and you can see that, nah, I mean, if we are applying this blur in order to remove the noise, all this noise in the background, nah, I mean, I'm still, I mean, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of noise over here. The image doesn't really look nice. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't really like it. Now let's move to the medium blur. And in this case, you can see that the image appears to be completely and absolutely perfect i mean it it, it does it's not a 100 perfect it's not like we have recovered absolutely all the detail and absolutely it makes it like an absolutely perfect image no but we have removed the noise in the background completely you can see that in this image there's a lot of noise over here and in this image there's not noise whatsoever there's not any noise i mean all these black uh, dots we can see over here we can no longer see them over here so this is only to show you a very specific example of how you can use one of these filters, one of these blurs, which is the medium blur, in order to remove this type of noise. And obviously that, depending on the type of noise you have in your images, you may want to apply a blur function or another, and you may want to play with the different parameters and so on in order to achieve a better result removing your noise. But anyway, this was only an example and this is pretty much all for this lesson. These are all the OpenCV functions or actually these are three of the four OpenCV functions you can use in order to apply a blur on top of your images and this is going to be all for now. So let's see how we can apply an image thresholding using OpenCV. In OpenCV, there are two different types of image thresholding. There is a simple thresholding and an adaptive thresholding. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you how to use each one of them. So let's go to PyCharm, to the PyCharm project I created for this lesson. And you can see I created some boilerplate code for this lesson. So the only thing I'm doing is reading an image and displaying this image. So in order to move one step at a time, let's see how this image looks like. I'm just going to press play and you can see that this is the image of a bear. <laughs> and this is an image I'm going to show you in this lesson in order to, to show you how to work with thresholding. And in order to, to start getting some intuition behind thresholding, remember that the idea will be to take our image or image which will have many many different colors and we're going to convert this image into a binary image that's pretty much the idea or that's pretty much one of the most common use cases of using a threshold an image thresholding if i show you the documentation the opencv documentation for image thresholding you will see that there are different type of thresholdings, right? There are different types of, uh, there, there are different ways of thresholding an image. And in some of these ways, you will not be creating a binary image, right? But I will say that creating a binary image is the most common use cases or the most common use case, or maybe it's one of the most common use cases. So that's why that's the uh, application. That's the project we are going to create today. So that's the type of thresholding we will be making today into this tutorial using OpenCV. And let me show you how to do it. The first step will be converting this image, which is in BGR, into grayscale. So I'm going to call CP2 convert color. 
I'm going to input the image and I'm also going to call CV2 color BGR2 gray. And this will be image gray. Let's see if everything works properly. Now I'm going to display. I'm going to display only the image gray. Let's see how it looks like. Everything seems to be working properly. This is our image into grayscale. And now I'm going to call cv2.threshold and let's do our threshold. Let's work on our threshold. So I'm going to input the image gray and this is where we need to input a value which will be our threshold, right? I am going to input the value 80 because I have been, I have been doing some tests already and I have noticed 80 is a good number. And uh, basically this will be our threshold and this will be the simple threshold. This will be the global threshold. So this means that absolutely all the pixels in this image, which will be under below the value of 80 will be taken to zero and all values which are above 80 will be taken to 255, which is the value we are going to specify here. So this is basically how thresholding works. This is basically how this threshold works. You have to input an image, you have to input the threshold and you have to input the value at which you want to take all the values which are uh, above the given threshold. And this will be the thresh binary, right? Remember I show you there are different types of uh, thresholdings and we are going to apply the binary. So this returns two values which are red and tresk and this should be all. Now let's see how this looks like. Now I'm going to display tresk. And in order to make it more clear what is considered below and above the threshold, I'm going to display the original image, right? So let's see how it looks like. And you can see I'm getting something, right? So this is the threshold of the original image. So uh, thresholding is used for many different use cases in many different situations. And one of the most common situations or actually a uh, situation in which I have used threshold in many, many projects is to use uh, is to create a semantic segmentation algorithm, right? Is to segment your image into different regions for example, in this case, you have a bear which is in front of a uh, grass, in front of uh, something which is green. And you can see super, super clearly that the bear is darker than everything else, right? So if we apply a threshold as we are doing right now, we have successfully at some extent, but I will say successfully, we have keep the bear, we have kept the bear, we have segmented the bear from the background and we can see that we have the, the bear in uh, in dark pretty much and then the uh, grass or the background in uh, white right it's not perfect obviously it's not perfect and we are not going to have a perfect result using only a cv2 function an open cv function but i would say it's a very very good result uh, also you can see that there is some noise in the background so we could perfectly improve this result by using cv2.blur i'm going to input trees and I am going to make it a value of maybe 10 times 10 and this will be trace again and after that I'm just going to call trace again in order to make it a binary image again and let's see what happens let's see what happens you can see now I have removed the background also this has uh, made some, made, this has made some changes to the uh, blur I was detecting. Now I don't have so many details, but uh, you can see that if my idea was creating something like an image segmentation, like segmenting the blur from the background, I would say this is an okay result. Remember, we could be making different types of algorithms. If we will be making a, an object detector, for example, this is perfect in order to detect the bear, right? We will say, okay, now give me all the pixels with a value of zero, and that will be exactly the location of the bear. I'm just naming a few uh, very common uh, use cases of using an image thresholding, but for now, just uh, keep in mind that this is the way you can apply a threshold, and then this is also the way in which you can improve the results in case 
things don't really look perfect <laughs> from the first uh, try right from the first attempt so this is basically how you can apply a simple threshold a global threshold and remember how it works you are setting one threshold a global threshold and all values in your image which are above that threshold will be white and all values in that image will be which are below the threshold will be black that's exactly how the global threshold the simple threshold works but that's not really enough in some cases, right? For example, I'm going to show you another image. Let's move to another script I have prepared. And I'm going to show you this image. For which if we create a, a global threshold, if we apply a global threshold, there's not one single threshold. There's not one single value we can use as threshold that will give us a, a better image right that's it's it's that's going to help us in order to make it a better image a better looking image in order to remove all the shades and so on right so in a situation like this we could perfectly use a thresholding in order to make this image nicer in order to remove all the all the shades and in order to keep only the text we could perfectly do something like that but we could not apply the global threshold. In this case, we will have to use the adaptive threshold. And in order to show you how this image will look like or how this binary image will look like under a standard threshold, under a simple threshold, let's use a simple threshold to see how it looks like. I am going to, I'm just going to copy and paste the previous code because it's exactly the same. I'm going to convert it into grayscale and then I'm going to call CB2 threshold. And then I'm just going to display threshold right and you can see that this is how it looks like with a value of 80 now let's change the threshold and let's make it a value of 127 for example so you can see that this is how it looks like for a value of 127 so obviously we cannot use this now let's make it a little uh, maybe 100 instead of 127 let's see how it looks like this is not perfect either, right? We still have many errors. We definitely cannot input this into an OCR technology. So I could continue trying with different values. Let's try with a value of 60 only to show you. Uh, we could do this forever. And you can see that in this case, it's a little better. We, don't, we no longer have those huge black uh, sections, but now there are huge parts of the image which are completely gone. So there is a lot of text we are just missing by using this threshold. So long story short, there is not one single threshold we can apply to the entire image. So this is how we are going to use the adaptive threshold. Uh, we are going to call cb2 adaptive threshold and i am going to input the image i am not going to input the threshold anymore because the idea with this function is that opencv will figure the threshold out by itself right this will be something like magic <laughs> absolutely every single section in this image will have its own threshold and this will be um, computed for like on itself right we are not going to input the threshold but we do need to input the value at which we want to take all the values which are higher than the given threshold which will be found by itself um, and then we need to input some additional parameters i'm just going to call this thresh and let me go back to the documentation so we can see it more clear and uh, how the documentation looks like I'm just going to copy and paste. I'm going to copy and paste this one and I'm just going to change it with some more values. Okay. Going to do something like this. Okay. So uh, let's go one step by time. I'm going to change this by 20, if I'm not mistaken, and this by 30, if I'm not mistaken. So this is basically what I have done. I have copy and pasted some values, some parameters. So you can see this one is a, a parameter, which is it's a, there are there are different ways to apply this adaptive threshold. You can 
apply it in two different ways so there are two different values you can set here one of them is adaptive threads gaussian and the other one is adaptive threads mean so basically just remember there are two different ways to apply this adaptive threshold then the the thresholding type which it will be exactly the same as in the previous case threshold binary binary and then these two constants which has to do also with the way the adaptive threshold works now remember we will not have only one threshold for the entire image but we will have many 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 different thresholds because we will apply something like a sliding window we will move through the image we will create very small sections in this image and for each one of these sections we will compute a threshold we will compute the ideal threshold for that specific region right so we will have many thresholds each one for each one of these uh, small regions and this has to do with that this is the size of the region if i remember correctly this has to be an odd number and this is another number which is used through this calculation, through this um, how the threshold is computed. So this is basically how the adaptive threshold works. And now let's see what happens if I press play by using the adaptive threshold. You can see that I have made a mistake, obviously. And let's see why, because I am not taking image gray. Now I am using image gray, so everything should be okay. And I have another error log side divided by two is one. Oh, i made a mistake this one we can make it 30 for example but this one should be odd okay let's see now and this is the result by applying an adaptive threshold you can see that now we are getting exactly all the text in this image and we are getting only a text and we are not getting all those strange situations as we were having before right we are not having like those uh, huge sections in the image which were completely black or those other sections which were completely missing now we are getting the text and only the text and if we were using something like an OCR technology if we input something like this it's much 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 better for the algorithm much 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 better in order to be more, cl more clear on the difference between the adaptive threshold and the simple threshold, let's just play one next to the other. I'm just going to the other script and going to copy and paste this value. And this will be adaptive thresk. And this is simple thresk. And this should be all. And now let's do something like this. And let's just plot one next to the other and so we can see the difference, right? So uh, this is the original image. This is the, let's see, oh, I see it. I named these two windows the same way. Now it should work, okay. So this is the original image. This is the adaptive threshold result. And this is the simple threshold result. You can see that it makes a difference. It definitely makes the difference. <laughs> so uh, this is going to be all for this lesson. And this is how you can apply an image stress holding using OpenCV. So let's see how we can implement an edge detector using OpenCV. There are three different algorithms you can use in OpenCV in order to implement an edge detector. One of them is the Sobol operator, the other one is the Laplacian operator, an a Laplacian edge detector, or you can also implement a Kani edge detector. And this is exactly the type of edge detector we are going to do in today's lesson. So let's get started. So this is a Python project I created for today's lesson. You can see the only thing I'm doing is reading an image and then displaying this image using Imshow. And let me show you exactly the image we are going to use in this lesson. And this is a basketball player. So we're going to use this image of a basketball player in order to show you how to detect all the edges in this image. So the way to use the Kani edge detector is very, very straightforward. And it's like this. You, you have to call CB2 Kani. You have to input your image and you also have to input two numbers, which I'm going to set in 100 and 200. I'm going to explain exactly what are these numbers in a couple of minutes, but for now, let's just complete this edge detector. So this will be my um, image edge. 
And now I'm going to visualize the image the same way as, as I was doing before. And I'm also going to visualize image edge. And let's see how it looks like. I think I made a mistake. This is Canny with a capital, capital C. And now you can see that we are getting the uh, edges for this image and you can see how well this performs. I would say this edge detection is working perfectly. And you can see that the only thing I did is just calling cb2.canny and I input these uh, parameters. So this is how easy it is to set up an edge detector using OpenCV. And now let me show you, uh, let me share a few details regarding how to set this uh, constants, how to set these parameters. These two values are related to how the canny edge detector works. There's something called hysteresis thresholding and this is uh, this is related to how it works. So if you are curious to know exactly like all the details of how this edge detector works, I invite you to take a look at this uh, tutorial on the canny edge detector, which is like the official OpenCV tutorial on the canny edge detector. And you're going to have a lot of details regarding how to set these two variables and what exactly do they mean, right? But if I will have to be honest, the way I set these variables, the, the way I set these two constants for when I was preparing this lesson, it's just by trial and error, right? Just try a few numbers until you are satisfied with the results. That's my recommendation for you. I would say that that's the that's a very healthy approach because also I noticed that this edge detector is very robust and it's not really that sensitive to different values. For example, if I do it between 50 and 200 and I press play, you can see that we are still getting a very good edge detection. The edge detection maybe it's not as good as the previous one because now we have a lot of extra details, but I would say it's a very good edge detection anyway. And if I go back to 100, maybe if I can do it between 200 and 500, something like that. Now you can see that we are breaking the detection a little, now we are getting less details. So if we go back between 200 and 300, we will get something like this, which is also a very good detection and you get the idea. Only by trial and error, you are going to find the values for which you want to set your uh, edge detector. In my case, I'm going to set it back in one, between 100 and 200, but please remember to play around with different numbers until you are satisfied with the results. That's a very good method in order to set these constants. And, and now let me show you a couple of additional functions which could be super, super helpful in order to visualize this edge detection. These functions are not really related to edge detection. These are the these are two functions which are more related to morphology morphological transformations in OpenCV. So this is not strictly related to edge detection, but I think it is a very good time to talk about these two functions. And these are CV2 delayed and CV2 erode. So uh, I'm going to do it one step at a time. So let's start with CV2 delayed and I'm going to call this image edge delayed or I'm just going to see it with a with a D. CV2 delayed I'm going to input the image and the image I'm going to delete is the uh, the edge detection right so I'm going to input this image and then I need to input an MP array so this will be something like MP uh, once and this will be something like five five and the type uh, MP int eight, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it works. And now I'm going to visualize it. So I'm going to create a new sentence and this will be image edge D and image edge D. Okay. So I'm just going to show you how it looks like, and then I'm going to explain what exactly we are doing here. So this is the original image, this is the edge detection, and this is the result from the dilation, right? From using cv2.dilate. So this is exactly what we are getting. And you can see that it looks like if we were drawing a new line around all these edges, right? It looks like if we were making everything to look thicker, right? And that's exactly how dilate work. We are making all the borders thicker. This is a function which is used in order to make everything, uh, in order to dilate all of your images, all of your uh, white borders or all of your white 
uh, contours, right? So uh, this is exactly how it looks like. And let me show you another example from the OpenCV documentation on how dilate works. For example, if you input an image like this, you are going to get an image like this, which is exactly the same image, but it's um, like thicker, right? And this is a function which you can definitely use if you want to enhance your visualization after you detect all the edges in an image. For example, in this case, we are making a better visualization in all these um, in all these edges. Maybe it's it's too it's too thick. So what I can do instead is reducing the thickness by using an ampere y, the, uh, which is three by three. And you can see that now it's basically the same idea. We are still making everything thicker but now it's not so thick as before. So basically that's how you can use CV2 dilate. And now let me show you erode. Basically the idea with erode is to do the opposite uh, function, the opposite operation as with uh, dilate. So I'm just going to copy all of this. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it here. And I'm going to input the, this image, the one we got from the dilate method. And this will be a row. Okay. And now let me show you how it looks like. Now we will have many, many, many images, but that's okay. We are doing the opposite operation from delete. So if you if I show you the image we got with erode, the image we got with the dilate and the edge detection, you can see that this one, which is the one we got uh, with erode, looks pretty similar in a way to the original edge detection image, right? We are getting the borders over here, which are pretty much the same thickness as the original image. Uh, this section over here doesn't really look like this one because it was super super cluttered so yeah we didn't really apply like exactly the opposite function but you get the idea that it's pretty much the the opposite right it's pretty much the if we dilate we are making everything thicker with erode we are making everything thinner right that's pretty much the idea and if i show you the opencv documentation for erode you can see that this is an example if we input an image like this and we erode this image we are going to get an image like this which is exactly the same image but with the borders eroded <laughs> right so that's pretty much how you can use dilate and erode in order to help you with your projects and that's going to be all for this lesson in this lesson we covered how to implement an edge detector using canny using a canny edge detector and this is going to be all for today So let's do some image drawing. Let's see what are all the available functions in OpenCV you can use in order to draw on top of your images, in order to do image drawing. These are the four functions I'm going to cover in this tutorial. We are going to learn how to make a line using OpenCV, how to make a rectangle, how to make a circle, and how to add text on top of an image. So these are the four functions we are going to use in this tutorial. There are many other functions in OpenCV you can also use in order to do a drawing, in order to draw on top of an image, but I would say these are the four functions which are the most popular functions, right? These are the four functions I use the most in my projects, so this is definitely a very good place to start with image drawing. Now, let me show you the image I have chosen for today's tutorial. This is the image we are going to use in order to draw on top, in order to do all of our drawings, in order to draw all of our figures, which is the image of a whiteboard, a completely empty whiteboard. So this is the image I have chosen for today's tutorial. I think it's very appropriate if we are going to do some drawings, we do some these drawings on top of a whiteboard, right? I don't know what you think, but I think this is a very good option in order to use as a uh, as an image for this tutorial. So this is the image we're going, we're going to use. And now let me show you how to make each one of these figures, each one of these functions. The first function we're going to use is cv2.line. This is the function we are going to use in order to do lines on top of an image. And this is going to be cv2.line. The first argument is the image we're going to use in order to do all the drawings on top. And then we need to specify two points, which are the starting point of this line and the end point of this line, right? We need to specify two points and the line will be 
the, the line between these two points. So let me show you. So I'm just going to choose two random coordinates. Remember that we are specifying two points. So we are specifying the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, right? I'm going to specify the X coordinate in 100 and the Y coordinate in 150. Then for the second point, I'm going to say something like uh, 300 and then uh, 450. And I'm going to make this line in the color green. So this is 0 and 255 and 0. And then the thickness, we need to specify a value for thickness for this line. And, and I'm going to say that the thickness is 3. OK. And let's see what happens. Let's execute, execute this code. And you can see that we have drawn a line on top of the whiteboard, right? This is what we have done. This is what we have made. So you can see that the first point, which is the starting point of this line is, if you look at these values over here, it's 100 and 150. So it's exactly what we have specified. Then the end point is 300 and 450, which is exactly what we have specified as well. So this is exactly how you can draw a line on top of an image. Something I'm going to do, because this is going to be very, very helpful, I'm going to print the image shape. Because remember, we are going to do a lot, a lot of drawings and we need to specify many points in all the different functions we are going to use today. So we definitely want to specify points which are within the shape of this image. So let's just print the shape. I'm going to close this window and I'm just going to stop the execution. And this is exactly the shape of the image we are using in order to draw on top. So this is very important. This is something we need to remember because we are going to specify many, 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 many different points. So let's move to the rectangle. Let's see how we can draw a rectangle using OpenCV. And I'm going to call cv2.rectangle. I'm going to input the image and then I'm going to input two points just like in the previous case. The first point is the upper left corner of this rectangle and the second point will be the bottom right corner, right? So these are the two points we need to specify and I'm just going to choose two random values. I'm going to say the first one is something like 200 and 350, something like that. And then the second point will be 450 and then 600 right remember we need to be always within the shape of our image so something like this will be okay now i need to specify a color for this rectangle and i'm going to make it red so red is bgr so 00255 and then a value for thickness and the value for thickness will be five let's see what happens you can see that this is a rectangle we have drawn and the first coordinate, the upper left coordinate is 200 and 350 and the bottom right coordinate is 450 and 600, right? This is the rectangle we have just drawn. And now let me show you what happens if I choose different values for this thickness, right? We specify a value of 5 and that's exactly the rectangle we had. Let's see what happens if I say this thickness value is 10. You can see that we get an even thicker rectangle, right? And let's see what happens if I say thickness is equal to something like 30. Let's see what happens. Now we get like a super, super, super thick rectangle, right? So choosing different values for thickness will give you different values for the thickness of the uh, figure you are drawing, right? Uh, selecting different values, you will be able to adjust the thickness of your figures. And now let me show you what happens if I select a value of minus 1, right? Every time we choose a positive integer, you already notice what happens, right? If we put like a, like a larger number, if we increase the value of thickness, the figure starts increasing its thickness. But let's see what happens if I, uh, if I specify a value of minus 1. You can see that in this case, we get a completely filled figure, right? In this case, the rectangle is completely red inside, right? We don't get uh, a value of thickness actually, but we are specifying OpenCV to draw this rectangle as a field rectangle, right? So the color we have specified is the color in which OpenCV is going to fill this figure. So this is pretty much all for the rectangle. I'm just going to leave it in minus one. Now let's move to the circle. In this case, we need to specify a function, which is CV2 circle. And we are going to call the image as always. This is, al this is always going to be the first parameter. And then we need to specify the point, the center of this circle, 
which I'm going to say this is something like 500 and 550 this is the center of this circle I'm going to draw and remember how this works this is the width of our image and this is the height of our image so this is how much space we have in the horizontal coordinate in the x coordinate and this is how much space do we have in the vertical coordinate and remember how this works over here this is the x coordinate and this is the y coordinate right it's like if it's like uh, in the inverse order right so this is height and width and this is x and y so it's like in the opposite order <laughs> but just remember how it works so if specifying a value of 500 it's okay because we, this is how much we have 1000 and specifying a value of 550 will be just fine because this is how much we have 671 so now let's specify the radius for this circle remember if we are drawing a circle the two parameters we need are the center and the radius so i'm going to say something like uh, 15 this will be the radius of my circle and now obviously we need to specify a color and I'm going to select green why not so this will be green is 0 255 and 0 we already made the line in green so I'm going to make it blue okay and now as always we need to specify a thickness value so I'm going to say thickness is equal to 10 and let's see what happens okay you can see that this is a circle we have drawn a very very small circle let's see what happens if we make it larger so i'm going to say the uh, radius is equal to uh, let's say 150 and let's see what happens you can see that now we have drawn a bigger circle a much much larger circle and it's uh, it's so big that now it goes outside of the frame it goes outside of the image right so this is what happens if the figure goes outside of the image nothing happens you're not going to get an error you're not going to get any any warning you're not going to have anything the only thing that happens is that opencv is just going to draw this figure within the image and everything that's like outside of the image nothing happens just um there's no drawing whatsoever and no error whatsoever either so this is pretty much all let's do something different let's do the circle over here because i have a lot of empty space over here so this is something like x equal to maybe 800 and y equal to 100 right so if i say something like this i think the circle will be in the empty region yeah the circle is in the empty region so perfect because we have all of this empty space and we need to do some figures on it uh, and let's make it a little smaller so everything is within the whiteboard right we have a whiteboard for a reason we want all of our figures all of our drawing on inside the whiteboard so this is pretty much all for the line the rectangle and the circle and now let's continue to the text the text is the last uh, function we are going to see in this tutorial so let's see how we can add text on top of an image we have to call cb2 put text we need to specify the image as always and then we need to specify what's the text we want to write something like hey you <laughs> and we need to specify exactly where we want this text to be located and let's say we want it in the um, in the other section of this whiteboard let's say this will be x800 and then y something like 450 let's say over there it's it will be in the lower right section of the whiteboard if i'm not mistaken <laughs> and now we need to specify the font which we want to use in order to draw this text and there are many available fonts in opencv let me show you if i go to opencv official documentation about drawing let me show you something if, if i go here you can see that these are all the different fonts you can use in opencv right these are all the different fonts so i'm just going to choose any of these i'm going to choose the first one and i'm going to show you how it looks like with the first font in this list so let's go back to pycharm and i'm going to say this is something like this okay now as always we need to specify a color and i'm going to say this color is maybe 255 255 and zero this is a mix of blue and green so this will be something like purple maybe <laughs> let's see what what color is this 
and then we need to specify the thickness value for the text which I'm going to say it's something like 2 I also need to specify the size of the text and if I'm not mistaken the size goes here uh, so I'm going to say that the size is 2 as well right let's see what happens let's see if we have any error everything is okay you can see that we are printing the text and by the way I was wrong blue and green it's not purple it's this color which is something like a light blue or something like that so uh, everything seems to be working properly but let's make the text over here right let's make it more in the in the center because otherwise uh, it goes outside the frame so let's do it between let's say 700 and let's see if that's enough let's make it 600 and that's okay so you can see that now we are plotting the entire text uh, within the the whiteboard so everything is okay and you can adjust the different values for example let me show you what happens if i make the text larger if i increase the size the text size i'm going to say a value of five and let me show you what happens you can see that now the text is increased it's much much larger and now let me show you what happens i'm going to make it back to two if i choose another value for the thickness if i say this is something like 10 right you can see that we have increased the thickness of the text so everything seems to be working properly so this is going to be all for this tutorial this is exactly how you can use some OpenCV functions in order to do some drawings on top of your images this is how you can draw a line a rectangle a circle and how you can put text on top of your images so this is going to be all for this lesson In this lesson we are going to work with contours and let me show you the image we are going to use in this tutorial. This is the image I have chosen for this tutorial and you can see that these are birds, these are a lot, a lot of birds which are just flying in the sky and this is something like a picture of many many different birds. And I'm going to show you how to use contours in OpenCV in order to build something like an object detector to detect these type of objects. This is a very very good image in order to show you how to do it because you can see that the birds, the objects we are going to detect are much much darker than the background, right? The background is pretty much white and all the different birds are pretty much black, right? This is like a somehow binary image and this is like exactly perfect the type of image we need in order to work on this tutorial. We could work with absolutely any other image, but the results are going to be much, much better if we use an image like this. So let me show you how to do it. So I'm going to call CV2 threshold. I'm going to input the image and then I'm going to input the uh, threshold, the threshold value at which I want to uh, threshold this image. And then I'm going to input the number at which I want to take all the numbers, all the values which are higher than this threshold but actually we are going to do it the other way around remember from our lesson on image thresholding there were many different types of thresholdings right in that lesson we used cv2 thres binary but in this lesson we are going to use cv2 thres binary imp because we want to take everything that's lower than 127 to 255 and we want to take everything that's higher than 127 to zero right that's exactly what we want to do in this lesson and i'm going to call this red tresk and let's see how it looks like so i'm going to plot the original image and i'm also going to plot the thresholded image I press play and you can see that this is what we get this is the threshold of the image and this is exactly the type of image we need in order to work with contours when we are working with contours we are going to detect the contours the borders of absolutely all isolated white regions in the image right that's very important we definitely need a binary image we need an image in which absolutely all pixels are either black or white and if we want to detect these uh, viewers if we want to detect these objects then we need to make these objects white 
So this, this is why we applied an inverse threshold, an inverse binary threshold, because if we will have applied like a traditional threshold, the not inverse one, we will have had something that's very similar to this original image where we have all the viewers in black and the background in white. And if we want to work with contours, we need the, the opposite, right? We need to apply an inverse threshold because we want all of our objects to be white. All the objects we are going to detect, we need, we need these objects to be white. So now let's continue. Now let's call the function we are going to use in order to find all the uh, contours in this image. And in order to do that, let me show you the OpenCV documentation, the OpenCV official documentation for contours. And this is the function we are going to use, CV2 find contours. And let me give you like a super quick note about this function that depending on the OpenCV version you are currently using, you could have three values, you could have three return values from fine contours or you could have only two, right? Let me show you in my case, I am using this version of OpenCV, I'm using 4.7.0.68 and in this version of OpenCV we are going to get only two values at the return of fine contours, right? That's very important because depending on the OpenCV version you are currently using, you could have two or you could have three. So this may change. For example, in this tutorial, in this OpenCV tutorial, you can see that we have three, but uh, in our case, we have two, or actually in my case, I have two. In your case, it depends on your OpenCV version. So let's continue. These are the constants we are going to specify for this function. And now let's see how we continue. Uh, contours are all the contours we are detecting. And ideally, if we go back to the image, let's see what happens. Oh, I see what happens. We need to do an additional step. I'm used to doing my thresholds on the original image, but in this case, we need to apply a CV2 convert color because we need to apply the threshold on a grayscale image. So we need to call the image and then CV2 um, color BGR to gray. And this will be image gray. This is the image we need to input into threshold. And from here, everything should be just fine. So let me show you three images, image, image gray, and threshold, right? Let's plot it again, just um, one second so I can show you. So let me show you the original image. This is the image we are loading from my computer. Then this is the grayscale image, the image we are converting to grayscale. It looks very, very similar, but actually this is grayscale. And now this is the threshold image, which uh, is being applied on the grayscale image now, right? It looks pretty, pretty much the same. It looks exactly the same, but we need to do it like this because uh, because of the way it works, right? We need to input a one-dimensional image here. We need to input an image with only one channel and we need to make things this way, right? Convert to grayscale first, then applying threshold and then we need to take this threshold image into this function. So this is how we need to do it. And now let me show you this object we have, um, we have over here, which is contours. This it represents and this contains all the contours in our image. So let's go back here. Ideally, contours will be something like a list where each object, each element in this list is one of these regions, right? With contours, we are going to have all the contours, all the border, all the borders of all the isolated regions in our image. So every single one of these birds, every single one of these white regions, we are going to have a contour for each one of them, right? In this case, for example, we may have only one for all the three of them because they're, they are not isolated, right? In the case of all the other birds, for example, this one, this one, this one, this one, you can see that they are completely isolated. They, they are completely surrounded of black pixels, if you want to see it like that. But in this case, all these three uh, birds overlap. They have some overlapping. So we are going to have only one contour for the three of them. So you get the idea, right? Uh, when calling contours, we are going to have a contour, a border for each one of the isolated regions in our image, right? Each one of the 
white regions, each one of the isolated white regions in our image. So this is exactly how contour works. So ideally, each one of the contours in this list should be one of these regions. So let's see if that's the case. What I'm going to do now, I'm not going to plot image rate anymore. And I'm going to do something like this. For CNT in contours, now let's iterate in this object over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to print CV2 contour area, right? I am calling this function, which is going to output the area of a contour. So I'm going to input this value. Now I'm going to press play and we don't really care about the images anymore. So let's take a look at the areas of all these contours. And you can see that we have many, many different values. We have uh, very huge values, very large values like this one. And then we have some very small values. I will say that this is pretty much how it always works, right? Because if we go back to the image, you can see that although we are looking at something which is like a collection of many, many different uh, white isolated regions, Actually, there will be a lot of noise on this image as well. So when we are calling something like CV2, find contours, we are going to get a lot of noise too, right? Many of these contours will, will actually be something like noise and we don't really care about those contours. So what we will do is we are going to get only the contours which uh, area it's big enough, right? We are going to get only these type of areas and we are just going to dismiss all these very small values, right? So let's do something like for CNT in contours if this, let's say if this is greater than, let's say 200 and see what happens, then we are going to continue, right? Because we are going to do some things with our contours now and we are going to do it only if the area is larger, is greater than a given threshold because we want to remove all the noise. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, let's move one step at a time. I'm just going to draw all these contours we have found on top of the image and let's see what happens. <laughs> so I'm going to call CV2 draw contours, draw contour, and I'm going to input the contour and also the image, which I'm going to draw on top of the original image. And then I need to specify a value for the uh, coloring, which color I want to draw this contour. I'm going to say this will be green. And the thickness value will be something like one. Let's see what happens. CV2 doesn't have draw contour. Oh, I see what's the error we need to call draw contours with an S at the end. And also there is an additional parameter which we need to input here, which is minus one. Long story short, just remember to add this minus one over here and everything will be just fine. So now let's see what happens. I'm going to press play again. And now you can see that this is a threshold of the image. This is where we are uh, where, we're, where we are computing all of our contours, but we are drawing the contours on the original image. So this is where we are doing our drawings. And you can see that we are drawing all the contours, all the borders of all the different views, right? You can see that we are just drawing a contour on top of absolutely all the viewers and if we go here you can see that this exactly as i uh, told you this was going to be we are detecting only one region so that's why we are drawing a contour which is around all of them right so please stay with me we are computing the contours here on the threshold of the image but i am showing you this drawing on the original image right and now let's continue i told you when we were starting this lesson that we were going to build an object detector to detect these uh, objects these birds and this is how we are going to do it we are not going to draw the contours anymore this is only to show you this function and how you can use this function in order to draw all the contours on your image but now let's call a different a different function which is um, bounding rect, if I'm not mistaken. 
CNT, let's see what happens. If I press play, that's okay. Yeah, that's exactly how this function is called. And this will be x1, y1, x2, y2, and this value. Okay. And now I am going to call CV2 rectangle. I'm going to input the original image and I'm going to input these values because with this function we are getting the bounding box around this given contour, right? We are getting a bounding box, the values for the bounding box of these given contours. So this is exactly what we need in order to uh, draw a rectangle and to detect this object, to build this object detector. So I'm just going to input x1, y1 and x2, y2. Now I need to input the color, which I'm going to say this is green too. And then the thickness value, which I'm just going to say two. Let's see what happens and let's see. Well, something is obviously not right, right? <laughs> let's go back to the function. I think I made a mistake and actually this is x1, y1, width and height. We are getting the information for the bounding box, but we are getting in in this format, if I'm not mistaken. So let's see now. I'm going to say this is x1 plus width. This is y1 plus height. Okay. Okay. Now everything is okay. And you can see that we have built an object detector to detect all these objects on the original image, right? Remember the parameters, remember how I use these functions, we are calling bounding rect and we are putting the contour as input and we are getting a bounding box from this function. This bounding box is expressed as xy coordinates of the upper left corner and then the width and the height of the bounding box and then we just have to call rectangle and we need to input the xy coordinates of the top left corner and the xy coordinates of the bottom right co uh, corner which is exactly this one so uh, this is pretty much how it works and now if i show you the image again this is exactly the object detector we have built and if you ask me, I think this is amazing. I think it's amazing we can build an object detector with only a few lines of code and that's amazing that we can just set this up and running in only uh, a few lines in, in only a few minutes. This is only to show you that if you want to build an object detector, sometimes, sometimes in some cases, you don't really need to use something so sophisticated and so state-of-the-art like YOLO or like Detectron or something like that. Sometimes a very, very simple image processing technique like the one we are doing just now is just more than enough to, to build your object detector, right? It's more than enough to detect absolutely all the objects you want to detect on your image. So yeah, never underestimate the power of image processing functions. Sometimes you can build this powerful technology, this powerful object detector with only a few lines of code. So this is pretty much all for this tutorial and this is how you can use contours in your images using OpenCV. And now let's talk about the bonus lesson. Let's see what we are going to be discussing here in this lesson. This is something I will say it's not absolutely needed if you're going to work with OpenCV or computer vision. It's not absolutely needed. You can definitely take projects and work in projects without knowing or without knowing anything about what we are going to discuss in this lesson. But I would say this is definitely a plus. This is definitely a bonus lesson. This is something you can use in order to leverage or enhance your knowledge about OpenCV, but it's not absolutely needed. And actually, this is something that I asked myself a few years ago when I was working in a computer vision project, and this is related to color spaces, right? Some time ago, I noticed that absolutely every single color space, or let's say all the most popular color spaces, they are of dimension 3, right? So, for example, BGR, RGB, HSV, LAV, and we have many, many other color spaces, and they are all dimension 3. So, I realized that if we want to encode all the information of an image, we definitely need to use a, a color space of dimension 3. If we want to encode all the color in an image, we need to use a color space of dimension 3. So I asked myself why exactly all the information in an image can always be encoded into a space of dimension 3. Why this number? Why 3? Right? 
So this is something I asked myself a few years ago one, while working with computer vision why we always need three channels if we don't want to lose any information regarding or images right because for example if you take an image from uh, for example in bgr and you take it to grayscale then yeah you can perfectly do it but you are losing a lot of information and if you want to go back if you want to take your image in grayscale and convert it into bgr you will not have the same result as you originally had right you are going to lose a lot of information so why exactly all the information in an image is encoded into a space of dimension three three that's very 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 important that's what i asked myself and i'm going to tell you what i found out so this has to do with our vision system right with the way our vision works with the way our eyes work with the way the, or the, the information from the eyes is processed and let me uh, let me tell you exactly how it works for example here we have a, like a very 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 high level schematics about how this vision system works obviously we are not going to talk about biology or anatomy in this lesson obviously that's not the approach we are going to take but this is only to keep in mind how a very very high level uh, schematics of this system looks like right so bottom line we have light we have eyes and we have brain <laughs> that's all the information i make from this image right we have these three components light eyes and a brain now let's continue and let's see why exactly all the information from an image is encoded in a space of dimension three and this is exactly why so uh, the human eye or eyes has three different types of photoreceptor cells for color and these cells are called cones right and in this picture you have the way these uh, cones these different type of cells respond to light right so in the background you can see that this is all the light spectrum and you can see that these curves have to do with the way these different type of cells response to the light right and i will say that uh, i'm not really going to focus on the curves themselves but i think the answer is basically here is exactly here absolutely all the information of an image or absolutely all the information which is related to color in an image is encoded into a space of dimension three because we have three different type of cells in order to capture color right so it's like having three different type of sensors in order to capture color so at every given time at every single time we are capturing information from three different sensors right that's exactly why absolutely all the information which is related to color it's encoded into a space of dimension three because at every single time at every given time we are capturing information from three different sensors that's all the color information we capture with our eyes so it's only natural from there to express exactly the same behavior into an image in OpenCV right <laughs> so I think this is very important because if you're going to work with computer vision yeah you have to mind OpenCV Python and everything that happens like within the computer but you also have to remember that you are also something like a machine and you are capturing the world with your eyes and you're processing everything with your brain so that's going to affect the way you are going to design some more advanced systems right i would say this is not going to make the difference into any beginner type of project most likely this will not make the difference into any beginner project but as you gain more experience in OpenCV and computer vision and you start making more advanced projects then this will make a difference right this is something that will be important maybe in some cases right <laughs> if you're going to work in a super 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 advanced project then it will be very important to know exactly what's going on for for you like right i mean how your computer your machine is processing all the information and from there you are going to build everything else so that i think this was very important and it was uh, once i uh, i understood this once i understood everything i mentioned in this lesson it made things much more clear and i understood much much better everything that was related to color spaces and everything that was related to OpenCV and computer vision so this is why i think this is so important and also the last thing i'm going to say this is a very 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 quick note 
that this three three chromacy, which is exactly this, having three different type of photoreceptor cells, it's something that it's common to humans and some animals, right? But there are a few animals which don't really have the same way to a function right which may have more types of photoreceptor cells right or they may have less uh, right they may have one or they may have two but in some cases there are some animals with maybe four maybe five or even more than that and i'm going to show you an example of this animal which is the mantis shrimp and this animal has more than 16 types of photoreceptor cells and obviously i do not know if they use all the 16 types of photoreceptor cells in order to capture color in order to sensor color or if they uh, do different things right maybe they have a different function but let's assume only for a minute that they use all the 16 types of photoreceptor cells in order to capture color so if they have 16 cells and we have only three this means that they can capture way more information and way more colors and this means that if these type of animals evolve in the future and they make computers, they build computers and they build something like Python and they build something like OpenCV, then their images in OpenCV will have 16 channels, right? This is what it means. So this is only a very, very quick note in order to complete this lesson. And this is going to be all for this lesson. Hey, my name is Felipe and welcome to my channel. In this video, we are going to work with color detection. Let me show you super quickly what exactly we are going to be coding in today's tutorial. This is my webcam, so hi, this is me. Currently, we are detecting all yellow objects in my webcam, so this is what happens when I am holding a lemon. <laughs> you can see that we are getting a 100% perfect and very accurate detection. We are getting a real-time detection. This is working on real-time. I am running this code on my local computer in a CPU so this is an absolutely 100% perfect detection and it's obviously going to work with absolutely every other yellow object I input into my webcam for example this is another example with a banana which is, which is also a yellow object so this is exactly what we are going to be coding in today's tutorial and most importantly we are going to work 100% with Python and OpenCV we are not going to use YOLO or Detector2 we are not going to use uh, TensorFlow, Keras or or any of those super super complex deep learning technologies. So following the steps of this tutorial you are going to learn how to build a color detection using Python and OpenCV in only a few lines of code. So let's get started. So let's see the requirements for this project. These are the three libraries we are going to use in today's tutorial. We're going to use OpenCV, NumPy and Pillow. As always, if you want to install these dependencies, you will need to go to the terminal and type something like pip install minus r requirements. In my case, I have already installed these requirements, so nothing is going to happen on my computer. But please remember to install all these dependencies before starting this tutorial. Let me show you a file I have created and that's going to be super, super useful for today's tutorial. I have created this utils file. It's called util.pi and it contains a function, only one function. And this function is going to be super, 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 super useful later on on this tutorial. You are going to see exactly why. As this is a tutorial about how to detect color using Python and OpenCV, you can see that the input of this function is exactly that. It's exactly a color. So this is going to take care of some parts of our process, which is going to make everything much, much simpler and much easier for us. But you're going to see exactly why in a few minutes. Now let's start with this tutorial and the first thing I'm going to do is to load or uh, my webcam because we are going to work a lot with the webcam today. So I'm going to create a while true and I'm going to say something like I need to import CV2. Then I'm going to create an object which is cap and this is going to be CV2 video capture. And I need to specify what's the webcam I want to uh, load using OpenCV and I'm going to specify it's the number two. This is going to depend on how many webcams you have uh, connected to your computer. It may be the number two, one, zero, um, who knows. <laughs> if, you, if you only have one webcam, it's most likely the number zero. 
but in my case I'm going to use number two. So uh, while true, I'm going to read frames for from my webcam. So this is going to be something like cap dot read, and then I'm going to visualize this frame. So I am calling to in show frame, and I'm going to call this window frame. So that's pretty much all. Then I need to close this window, and I'm going to do it once I press the letter Q. That's going to be all. And then I'm going to release memory and CV2 destroy. Sorry, destroy all windows. Okay, this is the most basic structure we need in order to do nothing in order to open our webcam and just visualize our webcam stream. And I am going to press play to see exactly how this looks like. And you can see that we so far we have absolutely nothing. We are only visualizing my webcam. OK, so let's continue. Uh, what I'm going to do now, we have built our most basic structure in order to visualize our webcam. Now let's uh, let's handle all the color detection, which is what we are going to do in today's tutorial. And before starting the coding, the, the, the sentences, all the, the code we need in order to detect color, I'm going to give you like a very quick instruction in, in the HSP color space. When we work with images, it's most likely we are thinking about these images as if they were in a BGR color space or a RGB color space, which means that every single pixel in our image is a combination of the blue, green and red uh, colors. Absolutely every single pixel, absolutely every single color in our image can be expressed as a combination of these three colors, blue, green and red. But in some cases it's going to be very convenient to convert our representation, to convert our image or color space from BGR, which is the original representation or the original color space, into a more convenient uh, color space depending on our use case, depending on what we want to do with our image. And if we talk about detecting colors, we are going to work with the HSB color space. This is an image of how the HSB color space looks like, or this is like a model for the HSB color space. And you can see that we have something that looks like a cylinder and we have three different channels or three different components in this cylinder. They're called hue, saturation and value. And I'm not going to give you today like a very comprehensive description of this color space because we don't really need to know super, super in detail what exactly is the value, what exactly is the saturation. We don't really need to know like super, super comprehensively about these things, but we are going to work mostly with the hue channel. And if we look at the hue channel, this is where we are going to have our information related to the color of our image, to the color of all the different pixels in our image. Now we are looking at a cylinder which contains information for hue, saturation and value. But let me show you how this cylinder looks like if we look it from above. If we look at this cylinder from above, we are going to see something like this. So this is what I want you to think about when we think about uh, the hue channel, that we are going to have something like a circle. And as we go through this circle, we are going to be changing like through different colors. So different colors are going to have different values in this hue channel. That's pretty much the intuition behind working with the HSB color space. The information related to the image color, to the pixels colors, is going to be encoded in the hue channel, right? We are going to use this information in order to detect an image color, pixels colors. And we are going to tell Python, we are going to tell our uh, program or software to detect all pixels from a given color. So, for example, uh, I have already shown you that we are going to detect the color yellow. So we are going to tell this software to give us all the pixels within this region, which is the yellow region. Now, we cannot uh, ask this program to give us only one value for the yellow color because you can see that this is like an entire region, right? There is like an entire region of the hue component where we have yellow. So what we are going to tell our program and what we are going to be coding today is defining something like an interval, something like a region, something like, like this, 
where we are going to define what's the color we are interested in. And for example, in our case, we are going to work with yellow. And if you think about this representation, if this is something that, uh, if this is our model for the color and for the HSB color space and for the hue channel, you can see that in order to specify the uh, yellow, in order to tell Python to give us all the yellow pixels, we will need to specify something like two inter like, like an interval, something like these two values. We are going to tell our program to give us all the pixels that are within this interval. We're going to specify two values and then we're going to tell the software we are going to code today to give us absolutely all the pixels that are within these two values. That's pretty much the idea of what we are going to do in today's tutorial. We are going to use the HSP color space we are going to detect colors using the hue component, the H component, the hue channel of this HSB color space. And then we are going to define two values and we are going to ask our software to give us all the pixels within these two values. That's pretty much the idea. So let's see how we are going to do that. So the first thing we need to do is to convert our image from the BGR color space to the RGB color space. So we are going to do something like frame, then CB2, color, BGR2, uh, HSB. So with this sentence, we are converting our input image from the original BGR color space into HSB. And this is going to be something like HSB image, and that's pretty much it. So this is our HSB representation of our image, and now, the, the, what we are going to do now is we are going to call a new OpenCV function, a function we have never used before, which is called ring range. And this is a function we are going to use in order to get a mask from all the pixels that uh, belong to the color we want to detect. So uh, we are going to use this function and the return from this function is going to be a mask. It's going to be uh, exactly the location of all the pixels containing the information we want. And the way we are going to call this function is that we are going to input HSV image and then we are going to input two values which are going to be exactly these two numbers, exactly the interval for which we are going to tell OpenCV to give us all the pixels in this image that are in, in, in between these two values. So we are going to input two values and the way we are going to uh, define these two values, the way we are going to find these two values is by calling the function I have defined in the utils file. So this is exactly why I have defined this function. By calling this function, it's going to be very, very simple to get exactly what is the interval we need in order to get the color we want. And you can see that for this uh, function, the way we are going to use it is that we are going to input a color and the output is going to be exactly two values which are named lower limit and upper limit. The way we're going to use it is I'm going to import, I'm going to say something like from util import uh, get limits. And then as you can see here, we are, we need to input a color. So I am going to define the color we are going to detect today, which is going to be called yellow and it's going to be 0, 255, 255. This is yellow in RGB color space, right? If we want to define yellow, this is exactly the value for yellow in BGR color space. So the way we are going to input this function is by calling get limits and then we specify the color. We can do it like this so it's more clear. And this is going to be lower limit and upper limit. You can see that we need to specify our colors in BGR because this function take, takes care of converting this color to HSV and then it just continues to do some additional processing, but we definitely need to input this color in BGR. And then this function will convert the color into HSV and we'll do some additional stuff. And now the only thing we need to do is to copy these two numbers and to paste them here. So we are taking our HSV image and these two limits and we are calling the CV2 in range function. Now, let me show you how this mask looks like. Before continuing with our process, maybe it's a good idea to show you 
how this mask looks like so i'm just going to press play you can see this is a mask this is exactly how the mask looks like so we are looking at a completely dark completely empty image but let's see what happens when i input a yellow object something that's completely yellow and you see what happens so when we talk about this uh, mask this is exactly how this mask looks like we are getting all the pixels within our image that are from a given color we have specified yellow and this is exactly what happens we are getting all the yellow pixels in our image okay so now let's continue and you can see that we are very pretty much there we are we have almost completed this tutorial because the only thing we will need to do now is to draw a bounding box in our image so yeah this is uh, this is going to be a very short tutorial uh, you can see that we have only written a few sentences and we are pretty much there we have already our mask with the location of all of, of all of our yellow pixels but now we need to draw the bounding box and not only that but we need to detect exactly what's the bounding box for all of these pixels and this is where i am going to use the pillow library so i'm going to from pill i'm going to import image which is the function we are going to use from the pillow library and this is what i am going to do i am going to define a new variable which is going to be called uh, mask underscore and this is going to be image uh, from array and I'm going to input my mask so this is a new variable which is called mask underscore and the way we have created our image is taking our mask and then calling image dot from array so this is basically the, the only thing we are doing is converting our image from being an ampy array which is OpenCV representation for our image and we are just converting this image into pillow that's the only thing we are doing we are keeping exactly the same information but in a slightly different format and now the, the reason we are making this conversion is because we are going to call a function from uh, this new variable which is going to be get bounding box and that is it if we want the bounding box of all of our yellow pixels if we want the bounding box of the mask i have just showed you a, a few minutes ago this is the only uh, function we need and this is how easy it is to get the bounding box we need for our object this is exactly why we are using pillow in order to get the bounding box because it's going to be super super easy to do it okay and now the, the another thing I, ca I can show you is how bounding box looks like when we have detected an object and when we have not detected absolutely any object so i am going to print bounding box and i am going to press play again you can see now there's not any yellow object in our image so nothing happens and bounding box is none and let's see what happens when there is a, an object you can see now we are getting some numbers and these numbers are exactly the bounding box and if there's not any object i get none so what i am going to do is if bounding box is not none then i am going to get the locations i'm going to ungrab my bounding box which is going to be something like this and then i am going to draw a rectangle with this bounding box and the rectangle will be something like uh, this is let's draw the rectangle on the original frame then we need to specify the upper left corner which is uh, x1 y1 then the bottom right which is x2 y2 then the color which let's draw this bounding box in green and then the thickness which i'm going to specify five and this is going to be equal to our frame and that is it that is all if i press play now we are going to see our uh, image we are going to see the the, the the stream from our webcam and we are going to see the bonding box drawn on top of this webcam so for example here i'm still drawing the mask i'm going to draw the frame and i'm going to press play again 
and you can see this is me there's not any yellow object so nothing is going on and this is what happens when i have a lemon or <laughs> which is a yellow object you can see we have at the exact location the exact bounding box for this object so yeah this is pretty much all this is pretty much the idea for today's tutorial and I'm not sure how many frames per second we are getting, but you can see that this is pretty, pretty real time. I mean, we are getting a lot of frames per second. We are definitely getting a very, very good detection, a very fast detection, and we are uh, getting a very good resolution. And most importantly, we are not using a GPU. We are running this script on a CPU. And you can see how good of a detection we have. Also, if I use another yellow object, for example, a banana, <laughs> you can see that we are getting a very good detection as well. We are detecting exactly where the banana is located. And yeah, so we are detecting the yellow color very, very accurately. We are doing it very, very fast and we are not using a GPU. So this is amazing. This is a very, very good object detector. Hey, my name is Felipe and welcome to my channel. In this video, we are going to make a face anonymizer. Face anonymization is a very important area of research in computer vision and it involves to take a person's face and to make it completely anonymous. So in this video, I am going to show you a very simple but a very effective computer vision algorithm to completely anonymize all the faces in an image or a video using 100% Python and OpenCV. This is an ideal project for beginners in computer vision. I am going to show you how to take an image, a video or a webcam containing a person, how to locate exactly where the face of that person is located and how to apply a very simple computer vision technique in order to completely anonymize that person's face. Yeah, exactly like this. <laughs> So, following the steps of this tutorial, you will be able to build a face anonymizer using Python and OpenCV. So let's get started. And this is exactly the process in which we are going to be working today. You can see that this is a four steps process, so in only four steps we are going to have our face anonymizer up and running. And you can also see how simple this process will be. The first step will be to read an image, to read the image we are going to anonymize, then we are going to detect all the faces in this image then we are going to blur all these faces we still don't know what blurring means but i'm going to show you in a few minutes and then we are going to save this image back to our disk back to back to our computer so this is exactly the process in which we are going to be working today and the first thing we're going to do is to set up this process for an individual image to set this uh, system this pipeline this uh, face anonymizer for only one individual image and then at the end of this tutorial i'm going to show you how to take the same process to an entire video or how to apply the same process to a webcam so let's start with it and the first thing i'm going to show you is the requirements we are going to use in this process you can see that we are going to use only two libraries we're going to use OpenCV and MediaPipe we are going to use MediaPipe face detector in order to detect all the faces in our image so these are the two libraries we are going to use as always please remember to install these dependencies before starting with this tutorial and now let's get started so I'm going to start with the first step which is reading an image in order to that I am going to need CV2 so I'm just going to import CV2 uh, and then, as always, I am going to define uh, an image which is called image EMG, IMG, and this will be CV2 in read, and then my image path, which I haven't defined, but I am going to define it now. Image path will be, I'm going to use an image which is in this location, data test image. Okay, so. This is exactly the image I am going to show you uh, how to uh, how, how to detect all the faces and how to anonymize all the faces in this image. Actually, we only have one face, but you know what I mean. I'm going to use this image as an example in this uh, stage, and this is the image I have just uh, loaded using OpenCV. Let's go one step at a time and let's see if everything works properly. I'm just going to execute this code as it is. Everything works properly. Okay, so we can continue. And we have completed the first step in our four steps process. So we are one step closer to reach our goal. 
that's a very good news for us. <laughs> now let's continue with the next step and this is where we are going to detect all the faces in this image. So what I'm going to do is to imp uh, import the other library, I'm going to import MediaPipe as MP and this is how we are going to do it. The first step will be to create the object which we are going to use, I'm going to call this object something like MP face detection and this will be MP solutions face detection. Okay. Uh, and then I'm, what I'm going to do is with uh, MP face detection dot face detection and I need to input two parameters. One of them is the mean detection confidence and the other one is the model selection. Uh, I'm going to set the model selection in zero and I'm going to set the mean detection confidence in something like 0.5. And I'm going to I'm, I'm going to explain exactly what these parameters mean in a, in a couple of minutes. But for now, let me continue. I am going to open this object as face detection, and then I'm just going to do nothing for now. Okay. So what we have done here, I'm going to change the order because it's going to be more clear. I have uh, created this new object, which is the object we are going to use in order to detect all the faces in our images. And this uh, object requires two parameters. One of them is called model selection and the other one is mean detection confidence. Model selection refers to uh, when we are using the face detector for media pipe, there are two different models we can use. We can set this value in zero or one. And if we use zero means that we are going to detect faces in, uh, how to say it, in faces which are very close to the camera, in faces which are within two meters from the camera. This is the situation where this model performs the better. And this, uh, and then if we set it in one is because we are going to detect faces which are farther than five meters away from the camera, right? So this is why I have set this value in zero. If I show you the image we are going to use in this stage of this process, you can see that this is an image which was taken very near the camera. So we definitely need to use this value for model selection. Um, and then for mean detection confidence, I think 50% is a good value. We could put it in a higher value. We could make like a, we could use like a higher confidence value, but I think 50% is going to be fine for now. Uh, so this is why I have selected these two values. And now we have an object, which is the object we are going to use in order to detect all the faces in our image. And this is how we are going to do it. Uh, I am going to convert my input image from BGR uh, to RGB because the face detector we are going to use it needs to detect faces on an RGB image. So I am going to call CV2 convert color and then I'm going to input image and then CV2 color BGR to RGB. Okay. And now that I have created this object, what I am going to do is to call face detection process and I'm going to input my uh, my image, my RGB image. And I am going to call this object out. So out will be the output from processing this image. And now in order to go one step at a time, I'm going to show you exactly how out looks like. So I am going to print uh, out, but I'm going to print all detections which are under the detections attribute of the output of this processing, right? If I show you this uh, object, this attribute, this is how it looks like. You can see that now we have a lot of information and this definitely looks like a bounding box. This definitely looks like uh, the face we are detecting because you can see we have four different values. This is the X, Y, and then the width and the height of the bounding box of our face, or that's what it seems. That's what it seems this is. And also we have additional information, which are something like uh, key points. We are not really going to use these key points with this are the, these are our face landmarks and we are not going to use it in this uh, tutorial, but this is only in order to show you what's all the data we have in this output, in these detections. Also, please notice that we also have the score, the confidence value for this uh, detection. And you can see that this is a very, very, very high confidence value. It's like 96%. So this is a very, very high confidence. 
So this is basically how this object uh, looks like. And what I'm going to do now is to extract this information from this object. And the best way to do it will be to do something like for uh, detection in out dot detections. And then if I show you back the uh, how this object looks like, we will have to uh, get this member, which is location data. So this will be something like detection dot location data. I'm going to call this location data. And then we have to call relative bounding box. So this will be uh, bounding box. And this is location data, relative bounding box. Okay. And then the x mean, y mean, width and height are these uh, members from the relative bounding box. So I'm going to do it like this. x1, y1, width and height will be bounding box dot x mean, bounding box dot y mean, bounding box dot width and then bonding box dot height. Let's see if this works only to see uh, only to make sure we don't have any error. We don't have any error. So everything's OK. So OK, so we have ungrabbed the bounding box from the face we have detected in this object. So everything goes super, super well. Now, before we continue and before we go to the next step in where we are going to take this face and we are going to anonymize it, we are going to blur it. Before, before we continue, let me show you what happens if the image we have uh, input doesn't contain any face, because that's another situation that could perfectly happen. If we run this process in an image that doesn't contain any face, we will face with an error and let me show you exactly why. So what I am going to do is I am going to print this object to see how it looks like. Not only in this case where we are detecting a face, where we are taking an image with a face, but let's see what happens when we input an image with absolutely no face. And in this experiment, I'm going to show you how, what happens when I input this image of a giraffe, right? This is an image I'm going to show you uh, what happens when I input this image into this script. So the, I'm going to change the image. Now it's going to be test no face. Obviously that the image I have just show you and the one I'm going to show you now uh, in this test, it does contain a face but it's not a human face, it's a giraffe face. So it will be a very good example in order to see what happens when we input an image with absolutely no face. So uh, now I'm going to run the same process again. And you can see that now we have a, a, we have found an error and we have found an error here where we started our iteration. And you can see that the print we have made of our object of our detections is none. So in the case of uh, taking an image containing a giraffe, <laughs> no, uh, I'm just kidding. So in the case of taking an image containing absolutely no faces, containing other type of objects, then this is what's going to happen. We are going to get a none as our detections. So we, before starting this iteration, we need to make sure that uh, out detections is not none, right? So I'm going to say something like um, if out detections, this will be enough, but let's do more clear and let's say if out detection is not none. So let's do this, right? And now everything is going to be okay. If we have found at least one phase, if we have found at least one detection, then iterate in all the detections you have found in order to uh, do everything we are going to do, right? We are going to anonymize absolutely all the faces we have found in this image, but in order to do that, we need to make sure we have found at least one face. Otherwise, this is going to find a huge error. We will have a huge error as the one we just had. Okay, now let's continue and let's uh, continue with our bounding box. In order to show you more clear that this is actually the face we have found in this image, I am going to do something else. I am going to extract these values, which are 
the height and the width of our image and I'm going to say this is image.shape and now I am going to rename x1 as uh, the integer of x1 times width this w this this uh, capital w the, the one of our the one representing our image width and then i'm going to do exactly the same for all the other values because remember the uh, the bounding box we have ungrapped it's a relative bounding box the values are relative values so we definitely need to convert it into uh, an integer and we definitely need to convert it into these values in order to use it later on on this script <laughs> so uh, this is how we're going to do it this will be this will be a y1 w h and now i need to adjust this by an h and this by an h2 now in order to, sh to show you more uh, properly how this works i am going to draw a rectangle around this face so i'm going to input my image and then these two values will be x1 uh, y1 and then x1 plus w and y1 plus height i'm going to draw a green bounding box uh, a green rectangle and then the thickness will be something like i don't know 10 and this will be our image and that's pretty much all and now what i'm going to do is to um, to visualize it and in order to do that i'm going to call cb2 im show image and this will be my image okay and then i'm just going to hold it with wait key and a zero okay okay so let's see what happens let's see if we have detected the face we should be detecting and okay so we, we are still plotting the giraffe <laughs> uh, because i haven't uh, edited this image path so i'm going to do it now this will be test image.png and that's pretty much all let's see now and you can see that we are detecting exactly the uh, person's face we are detecting exactly the face of this guy okay so let's continue okay so we have detected this person's face and now the next step is to anonymize this step now we are here and we are going to blur all the faces um and in order to do that i'm not i don't need to draw the rectangle anymore and what i'm going to do this actually should be here right because this is where we are going to do it I am going to call an OpenCV function which we have never used it so far in this channel which is called blur and blur is going to receive two parameters one of them is the image we are going to blur and then it's the uh, kernel size this measures somehow the strength of the blur we are going to do on our image if it's going to be a very intense blur or if it's going to be a more soft blur right so I am going to input a very random value i'm going to input this in 10 times 10 and we can adjust it uh, later on so this will be your image and let's see and the, the, the first thing i'm going to do is to blur the entire image so we can uh, get more familiar with the blurring so we can see how it works and then we are going to blur only the face but for now let's do it in the entire image and let's see what happens and I realize now, I don't know what happened outside, but it's like super, super uh, cloudy or something. So the lighting is uh, like uh, super low, but you can, you can see me. As long as you can see me, everything is going to be okay. So this is the image we are blurring. You can see that now it looks completely different as, the, as how it looked uh, before we applied the blur. And you can see everything looks like super, super blurred, right? in order to show you more clear more 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 clear i'm going to apply like a more aggressive blur and i'm going to do something like this and now let's see what happens you can see that now we have like a more more intense blur okay this is only to show you and to so we we, we can become like more familiar on how this blurring works and now we want to apply exactly the same blur but only on the face and this is how we are going to do it we are going to apply this in image 
y1 and then y1 plus height and then uh, yeah and then x1 and x1 plus width and the three channels okay and this is our face yeah these are the coordinates of our face and let's we should do something like this so this is what we are doing we are taking the face in our image we are blurring the face and then we are replacing the previous face void with the new face with the blurred face which is exactly what we want to do and now i am going to press play and let's see what happens and you can see that we are blurring the face and we are not blurring everything else but it's not very very clear because I have reduced the uh, kernel size to 10 by 10 I'm going to do it in 30 times 30 and let's see what happens and you can see that now it's much more clear that we are blurring this guy's face now I will say everything is pretty much ready for this step of this process because you can see that this guy's face is completely anonymized. We have successfully anonymized this person's face. Someone who uh, knows this person can't know who he is because now he is completely blurred. Now he is completely anonymized. So we are definitely one step closer to reach our goal. And now let's continue. Uh, the next step we should do is to save this image because this is the last step in our process. So uh, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going back here. Um, no, I'm going to do it here because yeah, I'm going to do it here. And what I'm going to do, I don't really need to visualize it anymore. So I'm going to delete these two lines. And the only thing I'm going to do is CB2 in write and I'm going to input the image, I'm going to save the, the image is, will be the second parameter and then I'm going to input the location I'm going to save this image into so this will be ospat join and this will be an output directory which I haven't defined there yet output directory and then uh, the name of this output will be anything I'm just going to call it output.png anything will be okay we could name this uh, image uh, with exactly the same name as the image we have read from our file we could name it exactly the same we could extract the name and apply exactly the same name but it doesn't matter this just had very dummy example so let's just do it like this so uh, i need to define these two <laughs> uh, values otherwise it's not going to work so i need to import os and then i'm going to define this output directory which I'm going to do it here before we start with the entire process this will be the current uh, directory and it will be something like output and then I'm going to say something like if uh, ospat exists output directory if not if the directory doesn't exist, I'm going to create it. So os make dears output dear. Okay. And if it does exist, I'm not going to do anything with this directory. Okay, so we can continue. I see that the light is back. I see that the cloud or whatever has gone. So yeah, you can see me again. Perfect. <laughs> uh, now let's continue. So we are grading the image into this uh, directory, into this location, and this should be it. And this is going to be all. If this works, means that we have successfully applied absolutely all the steps in this process, all four steps in this process, and we have anonymized absolutely all the faces in our input image. This means that everything is perfect and everything is ready and everything is completed. Let's see what happens when I execute this script. So I'm going to press play. Let's see if we don't have any error. We don't have any error. And now if I go to output, to my output directory, you can see that now I have this output, which is exactly the image I have input, but with the face, which is completely blurred. So uh, yeah, so everything works properly. And now we have completed this process for the case of an individual image. But at the beginning of this tutorial, when we started this tutorial, I told you that after applying this process to an individual image, we were going to make it work on an entire video and on a webcam. So 
This is how we are going to do it. This is just going to take us a few more minutes, but you can see that we have solved this problem. We have definitely solved this problem. So we should be super, super happy with, us, with ourselves because we have successfully solved this problem. What we have to do next, it's only a detail and it's going to take a few more minutes, but it's only like, a, it's meaningless next to what we have just achieved, which is uh, completely succeeding in anonymizing all the faces in an image. Now we only have to iterate in all the frames in a video and that should be enough. So let's see how we can do that. Uh, what I'm going to do, which is going to make things much, much simpler in order to continue with this process and applying all the all this pipeline, all this uh, face anonymization to an entire video, is to grab some parts of this process into a function. I'm going to define a function which is dev um, process image and this will receive an image and also a face detection object okay and this will be uh, all of this right we are going to read the image and then everything that's uh, after reading the image will be inside our function now this will be image RGB, this is face detection, so everything is pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, actually something I can do instead of doing this color conversion here, I'm going to do it inside of this image processing and now I can just input, oh, and now I can just input my image, okay. Okay, now everything is okay, yeah. We are going to input the image and this face detection object and then we are going to do all the uh, image processing inside this function. I'm going to return the image, return image, and that should be all. So what I'm going to do now is to call this function here. This will be process image and image and face detection and that's pretty much all okay so we have grabbed the entire functionality everything we have made in order to process this image in order to detect all the faces in order to uh, blur absolutely all the faces in this image into an individual function and what i'm going to do now is to make a few very very small edits in order to uh, fit this into different use cases, into different purposes, because we can, we want to make this script functional on an individual image, but also on a video and on a webcam. So this is how we are going to do it. I am going to import uh, another uh, library, which is ArcParse, and I'm going to define a few additional objects. I'm going to say something like ArcParse. Um, argument parser I'm going to create this object and this will be args and then I'm going to say something like args add argument and I'm going to define an argument which will be mode right we will have an argument we will have a value which the user can set in different modes so if the user wants to um, wants to input an image the, the user will specify a value of image in mode. And if he wants to detect all the faces and anonymize all the faces in a video, the user will select video. And if he wants to do every, uh, the same with a webcam, the user will type webcam. So mode will contain the uh, mode selection of the user depending where the user wants to run this model, wants to run this script. And then I'm going to add another argument, which will be the file path, right? Because if we are going to be working with an image or with a video, we are going to uh, read a file from our disk. So we definitely need another argument in order to do that. And this will be, I'm going to test how it performs with an individual image and then I'm going to do it with a video or with a webcam. And I need to copy this file path, this file location into this uh, new argument because now we are going to specify our uh, image location or image path in one of these arguments. I'm going to just delete this value and another change I'm going to do is that I am going to um, change the location we are where we are reading our image and i'm going to do it like this 
I'm going to put it here and I will ask what it, what's the value of the one of these are one of these arguments what's the value of mode and if args.mode in image then I am going to read the image and I am going to do everything else. And now I have to redefine image but which will be args dot um, file path. And obviously I almost forget, but I also need to say something like this: args uh, parks args. Okay. Uh, okay. Now everything should be okay. Uh, and now I, I, the only thing I need to do is to adjust this process and I'm going to put the image here and then I'm going to save it here, right? Because if we are reading an image, then we have to do exactly the same process we have uh, we were doing before, but everything should be within this if. Okay, now let's see if this works properly. Now I am going to run exactly the same process. I am going to run again exactly the same image, and let's see if we can produce exactly the same output. So I'm just going to uh, delete the image we saved a couple of minutes ago. I'm going to press play and let's see if we can generate exactly the same image again. Okay, so everything works properly. Everything continue working properly for the case of an individual image. And now let's see how we can fit this process into uh, in order to make it work with a video. Now, uh, elif args.mode in video uh, we are going to do exactly the same, but instead of uh, reading an image, we should be reading a video. So we will do, we will say something like cv2 video capture, and this will be args file path because now file path will be a video, will be the location of a video. And once we do that, I am going to read the first frame of this video, and this will be something like cap.read. I'm going to release the memory before I forget. And then the only thing we need to do is to uh, define a while true, because we want to iterate in absolutely all the frames. We want to read a new frame in, in, in every iteration, and this will be something like this cap.read and before we read the new frame what I'm going to do is to apply the process function we have defined so I'm going to do something like this I'm just going to copy exactly the same uh, sentence and I'm going to replace image for frame right and that's pretty much all we need to do in order to make this process uh, in order to make it work on a video Okay, so we are applying the process to an entire video and what we need to do now is to uh, save the video because we want to repeat exactly the same process. And in order to save the video, I am going to create a new object which is output, output video and output video will be cv2 video writer if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken, so I'm going to adjust it in a couple of minutes if it doesn't work. <laughs> and I need to specify a few arguments. The first one is the location where I'm going to save this uh, video. And this will be path join uh, output dir and then output mp4, right? Um, the same applies for the what I mentioned about the image. We could apply exactly the same name as the video we are reading as uh, input, but let's just make it simpler and it's just uh, I'm just going to define it as output mp4. So then I need to specify another value, which is the codec we will be using, which is this one. And then I need to specify the uh, frame rate, how many frames per second, and I'm going to specify this in 25. And then I am going to uh, specify the width and the height of this video, which will be the width and the height of the image we are reading in this video. So I'm going to create the object here so I can access frame. And this is something like frame shape one and frame shape zero okay 
And, and if we want to make it even better, the, the frames per second, which I have hard coded in 25, if we want to make it super, super, super nicely, we should be accessing what's the frames per second in the video we are reading and we should be specifying exactly the same. But let's make it simpler and I'm just going to hard code it in 25, but if we would want to make it super, super, super properly, then we will have to specify exactly the same frame rate as here. And that's pretty much all. Okay, I'm just going to run this process to make sure everything works properly. And everything does run properly. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Uh, everything runs properly, but we are still executing an individual image. So I'm going to say something like video. And the video I'm going to use as an example will be uh, this video which is a person which is talking in front of a camera and we can definitely see her face in the entire video. So this is going to be a very good video to use as an example in this script. So what I'm going to do now is video and the data will be test video. What was the name? Test video dot mp4. Okay, and now let's see if it runs properly. Okay, it doesn't run properly because uh, let's see where we have an error. Okay. Okay, right. What we need to do is to take this value and put it here. Okay, let's do it before everything else. So it's a little cleaner, but yeah, it's the same idea. Let's see now. Everything seems to be working properly. Let's just wait. No, but it, it doesn't work properly. <laughs> uh, wait through, process image, frame, face detection. We are reading this frame. That's okay. And then image.shape but frame is none. Um, let's see why frame. Oh, this is not white true. This is white red. <laughs> uh, I don't know why it was white true. It seems I, it seems I, yeah, I know I, I wanted an infinite loop for some reason, but no, we want to specify while red. Uh, okay, so everything run uh, smoothly, everything is executing just fine, so we can continue. So the only thing I'm going to do now is to say output video dot write, and then I'm going to specify the frame I'm going to write, right? But obviously I need to write this frame before reading the new frame, because otherwise I'm just going to read exactly, I'm just going to save the exactly the same frame I am reading from my video. But if I do it here, everything is going to be just fine. <laughs> and that's pretty much all. Now I'm writing these uh, frames and everything should be ready. So the only thing I have to do now is to release the memory, the memory from this new object. Uh, release and that should be all. Now I'm going to execute the code again and now we should be saving absolutely all the frames and creating a new video which is blurring uh, the face of the person I show you in this input video. And let's see what happens. If I go to output and I open this file, this is exactly how this file should look like. It's the person, exactly the same person I was showing you before, but now it's with her face completely blurred and you can see how well this performs. It, you can see that we are not missing a, a, absolutely any frame. We are capturing the person's face in absolutely all the frames in this video and we are blurring exactly the location of the face. So it works super, super, super properly and super, super, super smoothly. And now let's continue because remember, we want to make this work on the webcam. We want the user to be able to uh, anonymize all the frames in the webcam. So I am going to add a new mode, which is if arcs.mode in webcam, what will happen now is that we are going to run a process which is very similar to this one, but now I'm going to open the webcam, which will be 
Uh, remember, we, you need to specify a number. In most cases, it will be in the number zero because this, in case you only have one webcam connected to your computer, you are going to use number zero. But in my case, I'm going to use number two because I'm going to access another webcam. I have more than one, more than one webcam uh, attached to my computer. And then I'm going to release memory at the end, uh, although I'm not completely sure if it is absolutely needed in the case of the webcam, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's always a good practice when you are creating memory, when you are uh, creating an object and this object occupies memory, to release the memory this object is uh, taking this object is occupying. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to release the memory and then the only thing I need to do is a process which is very similar to this one. In this case I'm not going to save the frames, I'm just going to visualize it and I'm going to process it and I'm going to read it but uh, something like this, frame, frame and then I'm not going to write it, but then what I'm going to do is to call cv2.imshow because I am going to visualize this frame so we can see exactly how it looks like. I'm going to read frames from my webcam and I'm going to visualize it uh, and that's all. And then I'm going to wait, wait key. I'm going to wait for 25 milliseconds so it looks continuous, so it looks real time and yeah and that's pretty much all let's see if i have forgotten something so webcam reading frames processing frames visualizing frames and then reading a new frame and then releasing memory yeah everything looks proper and now what i'm going to do is to set this new mode which is webcam and now i will this it doesn't matter because we don't we're not going to use it but i'm just going to set it in none and let's see what happens i have already i have this webcam right here something is not working properly let's see what is it let's see if i made this proper cap video capture red frames cap red white red Process image, im show frame, 25 milliseconds, everything seems it's okay. Uh, can't open camera by index. Okay, maybe I made a mistake. Let's, ah, oh, because I haven't connected my webcam. That's the reason why. Okay, so I have connected my webcam. That took way longer than expected, but it doesn't matter. Now we are ready to continue. So I'm going to press play and let's see how it performs or let's see if it works with my webcam. And you can see that it works perfectly. Now we are detecting exactly uh, my webcam. We are detecting my face and we are blurring exactly the location of my face. So the face anonymizer is working super, super perfectly on my webcam. You can see that we are getting a real time detection. Everything is working in real time and everything is working super, super, super properly. Congratulations, you have completed this course about OpenCV in Python, so my congratulations to you. And if you enjoy this course, I'm going to invite you to click the like button. <laughs> and I'm also going to invite you to tell me what you think about this course in the comments below. My name is Felipe, I'm a computer vision engineer and in this channel I make tutorials, cooling tutorials and I also make courses exactly like this one where I talk about different things related to computer vision and machine learning. So if these are the type of videos you are into, I invite you to subscribe to my channel. This is going to be all for today and see you on the next video.